It's 6.30, I'll call the meeting to order and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mr. Studo, Mrs. Gonzalez, and the meeting is being recorded by NORCAM. And we can go <coughs> to our first order of business, which is uh, October 19th, 2020, regular and executive session minutes. If I could ask my colleagues, there were a couple of things I wanted to amend, um, but I didn't have a chance to do that yet. So if I could ask if you'd permit it to be tabled, I'd appreciate it so that I just have time to add in a couple of things that I think would be important to add in. I All right. Okay. Um, the next order of business is the COVID-19 update. Mr. Gilberto, you got a lot to report tonight. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Can uh, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think if everyone has been following along, we saw uh, an increase in the average daily um, case rate uh, from the week before last to last Thursday, which allowed, uh, caused us to go from having been in the state's green designation to being um, back in the yellow designation. Um, you know, not surprising based upon the daily case activity that we saw. Uh, I, I think we were looking at something like 12 cases in a seven day stretch in the early part of that most recent 14 day period. So I think that that's kind of what pushed us in that direction. Um, I, I believe that most members are aware that we've had a, a couple of cases of uh, positive cases involving students at the various schools, um, which uh, resulted in some uh, individual students requiring that to be quarantined as close contacts, um, as well as um, some, uh, in one case, an entire class that was uh, moved to remote um, learning for a, a period of time. Um, and that, that decision making is all being done by the superintendent of schools with the school nurses. Uh, the building principals, the public health director, and the public health nurse as well. Um, what, what's basically been happening is that we have a, a meeting for any case that comes up, where we go over that case and uh, figure out the right course of action in accordance with the CDC, DPH, and State Department of Early and Secondary Education guidelines and um, make the recommendations. So um, there, there has been some activity. Um, you know, I think uh, there was a couple of things that sort of were happening um, over the course of the past couple of days. You know, the weekend was quiet, but today I'm a little bit busier again. And uh, the state's reporting, for those who don't know, has moved from Wednesdays to Thursdays now. So Thursday evenings, the state members come out. We have an internal working group that continues to meet on Tuesday mornings, uh, including the school department, to go over the census and to get a better understanding of um, what's going on with the transmission. Um, the, the data out there, you know, to date has continued to be the story that I think you're hearing statewide, which is uh, we're not really seeing transmission that's school-based. We're seeing uh, situations of a parent coming home and family members then becoming sick from the parent from having been in close contact. That seems to be the most um, common transmission. And the state's weekly data now is, is highlighting that as a type of transmission along with a few other categories as well. So if you haven't had a chance to read that 30, I think it's a 30 odd page report that comes out every Thursday evening now, it is, it is useful. Um, in terms of, uh, I'll just go a little bit more with the local situation here in, um, in North Reading. Um, and we did have um, Halloween over the weekend and um, we had put out some guidance over the past couple of weeks relative to trick-or-treating and the reports are that most folks um, were um, uh, following that guidance and we hope that, that that will follow through with there being you know, any minimal to no impact on our overall um, census of students, oh, excuse me, of uh, positive cases. <clears throat> um, one other item that I'll just provide an update on is, you know, I think you're all well aware that we've been working towards um, determining what solutions might be out there for remote learning for families that are in need. 
um, and we've um, you know looked through and took a while to get some guidance from our uh, our insurance carrier with regard to the coverage um, there and um, about the same time we came to the determination that um, you know we, we would certainly be able to provide the program if there was a need uh, the school department was able to revisit with the YMCA to determine if there was another option out there within existing infrastructure and some of you may know that um, it appears the YMCA will be able to run a remote learning program um, uh, at a existing space that they're already using for some programming um, or uh, potentially using the YMCA facilities and I spoke with the superintendent of schools tonight and he felt that uh, the demand had not exceeded the capacity in that program um, you know, I did tell him that if, you know, and he, he had suggested that if, you know, they had, they did run into that issue, could Parks and Recreation be able to assist in, in some sort of an overflow? And um, it, it's kind of tricky because we have to hire the staffing in order to apply for the approval. So um, it's sort of a, trying to balance when that right moment is, but it would appear right now that the interest level um, is, does not exceed the capacity that the YMCA um, has and, and I so I think that we have a we have a solution there for the families that might need it um, here in North Reading. Um, I know that it's not necessarily directly COVID-19 related but again um, here locally um, I'll just offer some information regarding the election. Um, so we had early voting conclude on Friday at uh, 1230 over at the town hall and um, we had uh, 2,840 Voters vote early, you know, in person coming and casting their ballot at the uh, at the gym or something very uh, along those lines. Um, and then we had a total of six thousand six hundred and seventy-five voters vote um, through last night total, including the early uh, in-person voting and voting by mail or drop-off. Um, so there clearly has been um, quite a bit of activity. Um, I spoke with the town clerk about 20 minutes ago and, and they had actually been able to process ballots um, for those received through last night um, with only the ones um, that have come in today to be processed later this evening. So I, I want to recognize their efforts um, and the efforts of the, uh, I think, eight or so election workers who are working in room five counting ballots over the past, um, I guess it's eight days now. So. That was something that the town clerk had you know, identified as a, a solution. Um, I thought I knew at the last meeting was trying to nail down the details and make sure we had the staffing. Subsequently was able to put that staffing in place and we hope that that will cause for a smoother evening tomorrow night when we're, um, and, and, and smoother counting during the course of the day um, than, than we saw at the primary when there was a, a lot of um, issues with trying to process ballots that had been folded because they were mailed or otherwise brought in. Um, so, um, I spoke with the town clerk. We will be ready for, for uh, tomorrow morning at seven o'clock when the polls open. Um, I think uh, board members have all seen a statement that was put out and some information put out by the town clerk over the past two weeks, highlighting that we'll be following a different traffic plan and uh, both for vehicles and pedestrians. So vehicles will enter on the west side of the church, which is the commonly identified entrance where we normally see folks holding campaign signs. Uh, they'll drive along the building, around the back of the building, and then come back towards Route 62 on the east side, where they will be parking, uh, including handicap accessible parking uh, designated on the east side of the church with a single entrance on the east side uh, where the parish center is uh, located. Um, and so that's intended to sort of provide some shelter for folks who may be in line waiting inside. It allows us to make use of the long hallway in the uh, classroom area of the parish center at St. Teresa's to queue people up, we can maintain six foot social distancing um, inside um, if uh, the weather or temperatures are uh, um, posing a problem and then they'll be directed to their precinct when they get back to the lobby um, there. So I know that's a lot, um, but um, that is sort of the quick update on those, those fronts. Do you have any other information? I know Governor Baker also put out an edict uh, this afternoon, uh, which yes, is, I, is tail some activity. Four. Four, four edicts. <laughs> four edicts. Yes, I, I apologize. I just spoke with the chair uh, earlier about them as well. I'm just so, so focused on things here, um, you know, locally. Um, yeah, I, the, you know, some activity at the state level. Um, you know, there was a, a stay-at-home um, advisory order reissued um, that would, appears to be relevant to the overnight hours. It does have an impact on the open hours for um, um, establishments that are selling alcoholic beverages as well as restaurants with a 9 30 p.m. closure time um, so that i'm sure that there will be an impact on that. i believe so 
Uh, we have a couple of uh, days to sort of sort that through and we intend to discuss it further at our regular meeting, not only tomorrow morning, but I believe Mr. O'Leary is a Board of Health meeting Thursday evening as well, where I'm sure that will be, um, that will be discussed. Um, the gathering sizes um, you know, have been amended, including uh, the restrictions for indoor gatherings uh, reduced. Um, as well, so um, folks should be um, you know, aware of that. Um, I apologize, I don't have that order directly in front of me, so I don't want to misquote the, uh, the numbers, but they're smaller than they were. Um, 10 and 20. 10, 10. Yeah, 10 and 25, yep. And, so, and private residences too. And, and I have to tell you, I mean, I, I just think from the anecdotal stories that we have heard, and I'm sure that you have all heard as well, it appears that the order is intended to you know, address the types of gatherings where we are seeing the spreading is, is happening. It's not in the regulated environment that it seems to be happening, knock on wood, but it appears to be you know, in the more unregulated um, areas. And so I, I believe the governor is trying to address, address that. Here's a, the, um, the orders go into effect Friday and the advisory for the don't be out between the hours of 10 and five is an advisory, but the, there are orders relating to all restaurants, clubs, businesses, um, for the, for, you know, liquor licensed establishments for the and mandatory 9.30 close. And they're all still allowed to, um, they're still allowed to do takeout and delivery, but, Unlike the previous orders, they're not allowed to serve alcoholic beverages or sell alcoholic beverages during the mandatory closure hours. So it's kind of interesting that there's multiple orders within the orders. So I, I have a question, just clarification, and then maybe Mr. Gilberto, you can get back to us and Mr. O'Leary when you talk to the board or whatever. But I watched the news conference today and after the initial presentation of orders, uh, the media kind of jammed them and then it turned into advisory. And then they kind of went even press more. If you, if the, the, I think you can look at the press conference, but my question is that what is enforceable, meaning I know the restaurant one is, cause that's easy, right? You got to stop serving at 930. That's an easy one. But um, it seems that during the press conference from the initial presentation to the Q and A, it was backed off of what even at the local level from, you know how now I guess that even if you're alone in the middle of the field, you got to wear a mask, you know, something like that. So the question is, what are we going to do? And do we have even the resources to enforce that if we have to? And I, I only ask because, you know, even during the April like surge when we knew a lot less and people were being very careful, going around town i mean I, I i just feel like for our local here unless something changes i think we're i mean the the, the police are going to be doing nothing but stopping people and giving you know you know bad boy speeches or bad girl speeches and i i just don't know i, I just your opinion do we have an opinion yet on whether or not it's in like how we're going to do that or is it truly an advisory where you know, we know some people aren't going to follow and we're just going to do the best we can. Sorry if that was long winded. No, no, it's, it's not. Um, you know, it's something that the police chief and I spoke about this afternoon. I mean, there are clearly a challenges and expectations that the um, that this these these orders and or advisories may create for for us here. Um, I, I think that the feeling that he and I had was that we wanted to digest the orders and the details of the orders and discuss them with um, with the, the working group at our uh, at our regular meeting tomorrow morning to determine a course of action. Um, you know, I could tell you, as you can imagine, you know, in terms of where we have leverage, so to speak, that's not in the form of a fine or, or something else. It, it comes back to the, the Board of Health often to enforce. But when we're talking about the more um, community or, or, or other type issues that you know, we hear about with individual residents or otherwise, it does often end up in the in the lap of the police department to try to uh, to address and to mediate it and. You know, I could tell you from dealing with it going back to March, they, they, they work very hard to sort of resolve the issues that are out there without, you know, escalating things. Um, but we have some review to do to, to make that yeah. formal determination here because there are expectations that are outlined there, no doubt about it. And, and it's not, I'm, and, and again, I'm only asking, you know, I mean, I, I don't have this issue with a newborn, so I'm not doing much, but 
I read through the entire by bylaws of uh, North Reading. I didn't find anywhere where it says the Board of Health can tell anyone in this town what they can do in their home. So meaning, I, I'm just saying that I, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, is it enforceable? And if it is, how are we going to enforce it? You know, just because I think people are going to want clarity on that. And I feel like, you know, it's kind of like that uh, sign by law where let's not talk about it because we might open a can of worms. I feel like this work, this can is wide open. And I just, you know, I, I can already see where, you know, the board of health comes out Thursday morning or wherever after you meet and says, Hey, by the way, we're going to have somebody walking around. Like we check for sprinklers, you know, on the odd even days. And I could see how this is going to become a major issue in a hurry in North Reading. I think, Adam, I think it, that there's a degree of uh, authority that's conferred on the governor to take these emergency orders under the Civil Defense Act. And I think it's pretty clear that the governor can issue orders. There's a bit of confusion, but one of the things that's an advisory is the stay in your home between 10 and 5, 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. That is clearly an advisory order but the remainder the remainder orders are orders consistent with his previous orders that he's issued to to try to address the pandemic so I think to a degree that would supersede any particular bylaws and in some in in some of these orders it supersedes the the statute, for example, the liquor licensing laws. So in some of these instances, he has the ability to, to be able to give these orders in this, in because of the pandemic, because it's a declaration of emergency, a state of emergency right now. And, and, and Madam Chair, I don't disagree that the governor has the authority. I agree with that. I just think that it is, um, if there's an order that becomes unenforceable because there's no manpower or will to do it, then it, it just, that's what I think is like the, and again, it just, just trying to get clarification because especially for my age group, as you can believe, I'm going to get questions on it. I just want a good answer for them. That's all I wanted. So it doesn't have to be tonight. I just wanted to bring it up just so I, I thank you for clearing up advisory versus order too. Cause I, I don't, I'm not always clear, but I just, I don't want to have to say, uh, I don't really know. Like, I just don't want to have to say that, like, come Friday. So, so the, the ones that are mandatory orders that the governor has issued, um, they have a number to them. They, they have a number designated, and they are also subject to, for lack of compliance, a fine that gets issued. And in the orders that I reviewed today, the which this was already available if you if need be, you could obtain injunctive relief to enforce the orders. So, but that was actually written into one of the ones that that um, I read today. And I think I think in a general sense, it, people have to be made aware of these. And in also in a general sense, I don't know that we've had any major issues. Mr. O'Leary, you might have heard of more being on the being the liaison to the Board of Health, but. I think that, that our um, enforcement officials are just trying to go around and make sure that these, they're being complied with, that, they're, that people are aware of them, that they're, they're taking the approach of giving warning to make sure that people know about them first. I don't know that people want to just hand out ticket after ticket after ticket, but um, I don't know if there's anything that's come to your attention, Mr. Yeah, nothing's come to my attention. <clears throat> you know, the Board of Health has been working very closely again with the school department and with the business community, you know, to ensure some compliance. And uh, they've been doing a terrific job, a lot of communication, which is good. I think the biggest issues that we're probably going to be looking at <clears throat> in relation to the most recent order is um, <clears throat> compliance of people wearing masks out, outdoors, you know, whether it be at Ipswich River Park or at the play fields or in places like that. I mean, my wife and I go out, you know, do a lot of walking around and hiking and things of that nature. And uh, the amount of uh, non-compliance is significant, you know, and if now we're talking about, um, it's not just less than six feet, you know, the six foot distance It's if you're outside, you have to have a mask on, you know, and there's some penalty associated with it, then the public needs to, to know that and needs to know what North Reading is going to do about it because People are going to complain. You know, people that are wearing the mask are going to complain about those that are not. You know, people that are 
uh, down there and observing you know, people down, whether it be at Ipswich River Park, um, you know, not complying, you know, people are going to feel compelled and put out and are going to complain. And how are we going to respond? So they need to know, and, and we need to know how, how are we going to respond. Uh, by the same token, when we have now um, broader um, orders to um, limit what you can do in your own household as far as the number of people that can be in your own household, particularly, and again, it's targeted towards Thanksgiving and the holidays, of course. Um, people need to be made aware of it. And, you know, are they going to get a knock on the door? You know, again, it's forcing people to, to think about operating a little bit differently than they would normally. And, and I guess that's a good thing because we need to in order to, to fight this pandemic. But to Mr. Studo's point, you know, people have a, have a, a right to know you know, what is our intention, you know, as a community here, from an enforcement type uh, of activities, what, what are we intending on doing? What, are we, what kind of resources are we gonna to have to commit to it? So uh, I guess you'll have your conversations tomorrow morning, starting tomorrow morning, Mr. Gilberto. I know you started talking about it today, but, but to Mr. Studo's point, people are gonna to wanna to know. So, you know, it's important. Does anyone else have any questions for Mr. Gilberto? Mr. Stewart, does that answer? Yeah, no, no, I mean, no it does. Be, and again, it, it was just- To be continued. Yeah, it, it was just like, again, it, it just more of, I think that people, you know, Mr. O'Leary, you know, summed it up. People have done a pretty good job, actually a really good job in North Reading, but I feel that like anything else in life, you start talking about people's home, private property, it starts getting personal and, it just did. I've lived here three years and I've met a lot of people and I feel like a police officer mm -hmm. knocking on their door because they might have 11 instead of 10 people. That would be, in my opinion, I think a situation that maybe if we educate the public, like Mr. O'Leary said, I, we have to make sure we don't get to that point. I think in my own opinion, and this is just me, I think that would be I think that would have further consequences that this board, it would, it would become a, a problem at another level for this board, in my opinion, if, if people saw that, I mean, and, and there are a lot of things in the, like, it, it just, yeah, like, that's what I'm just saying. I, I just, a knock on the door, like Mr. O'Leary said, without understanding that, I think that would end not well for anyone involved, including the town. So that's all I'm just saying. Does anyone else have, Mr. Waller, any questions? I, I would just comment on that, that I don't think anybody's looking to like, <laughs> this isn't like the, you know, the secret police or anything else like that. It's the same issue as, it's no different than having minors in your house drinking down in the basement. You know, the police aren't looking to do that, but if they get called in and it becomes obvious, they're going to come knocking on the door. Of course they're going to come knocking on the door. So I think it's like, I think people in town are very rational. I think people are reasonable. I think educating about what the issues are is really what you should do. And if any one particular household blatantly violates it, I'm sure they're gonna you know, be visited by the police politely. I can't imagine it being anything different. I don't think we should escalate this any further than that. Um, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's justified. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions, comment? You're on mute too. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, no, no, nothing further. Just, you know, that I, I, I mean, I, I have utmost confidence in our police department that they will handle it appropriately. Okay, thank you. So more, more to come, I think, from the kind of dissecting it. It just came, they just came through not too long ago and there were four, four of the orders and then the advisory. So I think it's a lot to dissect. So hopefully we'll be hearing a little bit more and whatever can be posted on the <laughs> town's website would um, be helpful to, for people to, to know. Mr. Gilberto, I think is going to mute everybody so that we can have an orderly meeting. And if, someone wants to speak just unmute yourself and for any attendees if you'd like to speak you can use the chat function um, that 
is at the bottom of the screen. If you want to speak, you can just let us know that you want to speak or use the raise hand function that's also available. Our next order of business actually sort of business is public comment. So does anyone in attendance wish to speak for public comment? So I see none. Do you see any, Mr. Gilberto? I'm not seeing anyone. No. Okay. Moving on to our next order of business, we have Veterans Day, which is coming up on um, November 11th, and we have a proclamation in our packet. Just going to get to that. Mm -hmm. Give me a second, folks. Uh, the proclamation is the Town of North Reading Veterans Day 2020 proclamation. Whereas in a world where a pandemic has stunted our lives in so many unimaginable ways, we come together today with honor and pride to commemorate the legacy of all veteran generations who have served and sacrificed for this great nation. Today, we take time to reflect with pride and gratitude for America's men and women in uniform who have selflessly sacrificed and committed their lives to answer the call to defend our nation. And whereas today, this great land has seen a horrific epidemic of violence that has rocked this nation to the core, resulting in deployments of warriors throughout many sections of this country to assist law enforcement agencies, our veterans have shed their blood and families have sacrificed their loved ones for our freedom of speech. We as Americans should not take this for granted. We should take time and think before we act and speak. We are all Americans and should respect one another, no matter their race, creed, or color. And whereas in a world today where we are forced to live in a virtual communicative state, we must be ever mindful of our veterans struggling with mental health issues, addictions, and homelessness that is amplified due to COVID-19. We must remain vigilant, proactive, and work together to assist and guide our veterans in need. And whereas our world today continues to deal with the stress of absenteeism from their loved ones, families, and friends, this hardship has added additional stress to our warriors coming home from tours of duty and months of training, then forced to quarantine for weeks before being reunited with their loved ones. Please keep them in your prayers. And whereas on this day, we honor our Gold Star families who have sacrificed the ultimate, keep them in your prayers. They will forever carry the legacy of their loved one through memories. And whereas on this day, we renew our commitment to our children through guidance and education, the importance of honor, respect, and appreciation for the valor and sacrifice our veterans and warriors have made. We must continue to educate them on the history of this great nation. Now, therefore, we, the Select Board of North Reading, do hereby proclaim that Veterans Day shall be celebrated on this 11th day of November 2020 in the town of North Reading. We encourage you to continue to display the American flag with pride on your homes, offices, and town buildings to recognize the valor and sacrifices of our veterans and warriors through ceremony and prayer given at the select board meeting the second day of November, 2020. Just get back to this screen. And so Mr. Gilbert, do we have a motion associated with that? We do. I hope yeah. it wasn't a motion to read the proclamation. It was a motion <laughs> was to it? read the proclamation. I just didn't <laughs> want to interrupt you. I'm sorry, I went backwards. I'll second that. Too late. <laughs> 
<laughs> Too late. So, but, uh, Matt, uh, I, mean, I think we probably have unanimous support, and yeah. I apologize. I mean, I can only <laughs> say, Madam Chair, I move to approve the motion you just read. But I, or I, Madam Chair, I move to read the Veterans Day proclamation. Sorry, Mr. Studo. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? Did all you have those again? All those in favor, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Let's take comments from uh, my colleagues. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, no need for the chair to reread it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, and again, I, I don't, what are they doing for activities, Mr. Gilberto? Uh, it's it's going to be something virtual? Yeah, there's a virtual um, program that's being developed by NORCAM, and uh, I hate to put him on the spot, but I know Mr. Healy is here this evening. Phil, would you be willing just to give us a, a quick update? Am I, is that a fair question? As I put you on the spot. He's muted. Uh, you also have to unmute him. He's probably not listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> I like the rest. Well, I, I, know well, that I think that there's going there, but there'll be a virtual presentation, right. just as there was, I think, um, for Memorial Day. They, the NORCAM is planning to do a virtual presentation, and uh, hopefully, even with the restrictions, that we'll all be able to do the things that we normally do to remember veterans, whether it's going to a veteran's grave and tending to the grave and putting flowers on it or visiting a veteran in your family or your friends or your home or thanking veterans or whatever we can do to remember veterans is still, they're still serving all over the world. We're still creating veterans every day and we're still there's still many people that are that are being deployed every day oh, and here's mr healy to tell us a little bit more so oh i apologize uh you might hear a little funny. feedback uh, thanks mr healy welcome well well hey how you doing uh, thank you for having me and thank you for acknowledging norcam's uh program which uh you can thank the lovely susan magner for uh bringing us into the fold and encouraging us to do the same thing we did with the memorial day program we're essentially on uh, our public channel and our government channel at the 11th hour of the 11th day of November. Uh, we will be having a, a program of pre-taped uh, intros and also uh, a melange of uh, clips from previous uh, Veterans Day uh, ceremonies, which are on YouTube as well. And if you feel free to check them out on NORCAM, uh, NORCAM's YouTube page, if you just go to NORCAM and type in, or YouTube, sorry, and type in NORCAM, you'll be able to find it. But yeah, our, and let me get you those public channels. So uh, on Comcast, it's channel eight for public access and on Verizon, I believe it's channel 26 and government channel is 22 on Comcast and 24 on Verizon. So on 11 a.m. on uh, the government channel uh, and on our um, public channel on Wednesday, November 11th, you'll be able to see a program. And thank you to everyone involved. And thanks again to Sue Magner and everyone in town. And yeah, so we might even add this proclamation in, we'll see. It makes it but thank you again for having us and yeah hey, i'll go back to running around and making sure this thing is running so i apologize thank you mr healy all Thanks, right Phil. thank you mrs gonzalez any comment oh just uh always thanking our veterans um not only on veterans day but every day and um yeah don't hesitate to to do that you know it's it's always welcome they always appreciate it mr waller I've never served, but I always um, think about the uh, poor people who served two, three years that are living with a lifetime of pain and suffering from their experience. So, you know, I respect all veterans, but just every time I think about that, it's just overwhelming. So my heart goes out to them. Mr. Trudeau. Um, I wish we had uh, more Veterans Days throughout the year. And I say that because I feel that, uh, unfortunately, past generations definitely deferred more to veterans than, than we do now, and uh, including my generation, where we forget that, you know, we get to complain on Facebook because, you know, Stop and Shop ran out of my favorite cereal because of those veterans. And we forget that we have the right to disagree with each other because of those veterans. And, you know, I wish we just 
If I, I feel like if we thought about that more, we probably would not have the ba- the tone we have right now in the country. I think we'd appreciate each other more. So, you know, I just wish that, you know, we had a little bit more of that. So, I, you know, again, thank you and more of, you know, I feel it's something that should be talked about more in classrooms and everything, but this is a good start. Yeah, um, that's, that's a great point, Mr. Studo. The history is so important. There is a, the schools are, at least the middle school sent out a notice for anyone who's listening for um, the students to submit pictures of, you know, their family and friends that are veterans because they're going to be planning something for the students. So every little bit of that helps to kind of, you know, reset the, reset the uh, direction, right? To really what's important and what's what's um what's a reality out there is people are, are deployed all over the place fighting fighting for our freedom so we thank the veterans all right so our next order we can move along to our next order of business which was i'm being i'm being notified by mr <laughs> mr gilberto that we're moving backwards to board member reports and all of my colleagues will be happy to know my new glasses are coming in. So <laughs> uh, board member reports, let's get a, get some board member reports. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, just um, deep into um, expiring terms and my liaison work to get lots filled and I'm um, still working with, the recycling committee towards um, finishing up the, their work so that they can get some grant money. Um, but that's about it right now for me to report. Okay, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, you're pretty much up to date on the, uh, the Board of Health. Again, they're very busy meeting more often than, than usual. Um, so you've been brought up to date on that and there'll be more to report at the next meeting, I suppose. Uh, water and wastewater, again, we have another meeting this week, so we'll have a, more information uh, regarding that uh, at, a, at a later date. Uh, the only other thing is that I just want to, again, uh, acknowledge the efforts of, uh, of the town clerk, the election workers, and uh, all the effort that they've, they've put in over the last uh, few weeks here in relation to the election, because it's a tremendous undertaking, and it certainly uh, deviates from what, uh, what the norm has been you know, for activities, election activities here in North Reading. And uh, they've risen to the challenge and it's, it's heartening to hear that they've been able to process over 6,000 votes already and they don't make, make for a smooth uh, election day tomorrow as people come out. And as uh, everybody's aware, I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a historic uh, turnout and uh, consequential too, as far as uh, whatever results come out of this whole thing. And uh, to Mr. Studo's point, you know, we just talked about Veterans Day and the sacrifices that were made for people so that we could enjoy the freedoms that we have here. And, you know, what's, what's disheartening is that, you know, we, we've, we're witnessing um, concerted efforts on some people's parts to deliberately and intentionally suppress people's, people's right to vote. There's been no less than 40 lawsuits already filed, and that's directly and intentionally to suppress the vote, and also to ensure that votes that have already been cast by people won't be counted. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. People have sacrificed their lives for us to have this ability to do that. Um, and, and it's unfathomable. And again, I don't care what side anybody's on in relation to presidential race or ballot issues or anything else. Everyone should have a free and clear shot at going in and exercising their right to vote and they shouldn't be suppressed. And you look, you look at Texas even, I mean, Texas has had more people vote already early and by mail than voted in the entire 2016 election and tomorrow's election day. And that's despite the efforts of their governor down there, you know, one ballot box for a drop off in a 170 square mile county. You know, it's, it's absurd, it's unbelievable. People waiting for hours in order to exercise their rights. And you, you think you're looking at a third world country when you see some of these things on the nightly news. But as I said, it's historic. Um, people are actually taking advantage of it. Um, people who haven't voted in the past are now voting because they don't like what they've seen. They don't like what they're hearing. They, they don't like being suppressed. And um, again, the consequences um, are in the hands of the voters. 
and they'll have their say uh, tomorrow and we'll find out soon enough what it is. And I, again, I encourage everybody uh, to go out and participate. And fortunately here in Massachusetts, it's not so bad, but in other parts of the country, it's, uh, it's uh, unexplainable. Right? So again, it's been exhausting. Uh, the last uh, four, year, four years have been exhausting. Uh, I think voters are gonna grant us some relief and I look forward to the uh, to the results and encourage everybody to participate. And once again, I want to thank uh, Barbara Stats and her staff and the election workers for, for a great job here uh, being done in North Reading. Not easy and they've risen to the occasion. That's thank all, Madam Chair. Mr. Walner. Um, yeah, I've, I've been continuing to focus on the age-friendly uh, initiative, working with the consultants at UMass Gerontology. Um, I got a report today from them that we had uh, out of the 5,000 surveys, we've received over 1,200 back so far, and we have more to come because things are being pushed out because of the election. Um, we're probably going to be one of the highest return survey rates in, the, in Massachusetts because like, the highest I heard was 30%. We're at 25% right now. So uh, thank you for everybody for filling out your surveys. Special uh, shout out goes out to Maureen Doherty, who's on the call, who uh, took it upon herself to actually publish the survey in the paper and to uh, encourage people to participate as well. And I will find out how many people actually use the paper as the way to get the information out. So thank you, Maureen, for doing that. That was very nice of you. Um, and we're continuing on. We're doing four focus groups, key informants being one, um, uh, seniors, as you would think of them, being another. These are groups of like 10, 12 people. And then rising seniors, which are people who probably have kids recently out of school but want to are thinking about staying in town, so we want to talk to those people. And also key stakeholders, um, more municipal people, things of that nature. So we're actually on a fast pace to get this done as quick as possible because we're losing some people in December and we want to get all the data in before December. But so far, it's looking promising or making a lot of headway very quickly. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. and. Uh, um keep it going thank you thanks mr walmer mr studo um besides like looking at committee things um some with uh, in conjunction with mr o'leary for the wastewater and commission uh, water commission uh it's been pretty quiet cpc and zba not really much in the last uh, couple of weeks so um you know there hasn't been uh much to report there uh, let me piggyback on Mr. O'Leary to say that uh, Mrs. Stats and everyone else, Clerk Stats, is doing a great job. I mean, when you look around the country, even in our own state, somehow similar towns, similar to our size, hour-long lines. I mean, not, I, I haven't, you know, Texas being one of the case, Mr. O'Leary said, but there's other towns even in Mass. And, you know, maybe, uh, maybe uh, Barbara, if she has a, a few minutes after the election, can teach, you know, can teach a course of how to, you know how to conduct an election because I just it just boggles my mind and you know she must be doing something right because I see towns again our size where people are waiting for hours even in this state and here it seems like everything's been working so smooth I've talked to her like three four times over the past month so so I like to say you know great job there and also yeah tomorrow's election day whoever's left to vote which I still think there are a lot of people um you know I uh I have this thing about voting on election day. Um, you know, I wasn't born in this country. I was naturalized, you know, because I was born in Italy. So to me, you know, first time I voted was back in Malden at the Irish American, an Italian guy. So you tell me. Uh, but I um not unusual. You know, yeah. So that was uh so it's exciting for me to go. My parents who also naturalized. So but I'd say, you know, go and and do it because a lot of people went down, so you could. So you could go get your morning coffee, go there, say hello. Granted, this year you got to do it in a mask, but, you know, so, and uh, and hopefully, you know, whoever wins, however, like, if, if on Wednesday we can just get on with it, which would be great, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know what Facebook's going to do with the lost revenue, because no one's going to be on it. I mean, what are we going to argue about, you know, on the third, so... Uh, but yeah, so again, it's uh, tomorrow will be uh, interesting. So, but uh, but like I said, if you still haven't voted, definitely vote. Um, you will regret if you don't. Either way, you know, you never know. I mean, everybody always says my vote doesn't count until it counts. <laughs> so, 
Um, and uh, yeah, and that's about it. Thank you, Mr. Studo. And just on that note, and it falls open. I think Mr. Gilbert already explained and in, in, um, uh, clerk stats it has a message online on the town website. Polls open at 7 a.m. They close at 8 p.m. There's plenty of time to cast your vote if you're among the individuals like myself who wait until election day to vote. And um, be respectful, please, of people. Not everyone's going to agree with every little last thing like Mr. O'Leary says, but we can certainly agree to be respectful as, as we exercise our right to vote. Mr. Um, Gilberto explained um, the procedures and those are also available to everybody online um, on the town's website. It's a note from the chief and the clerk with regard to, with regard to that. So moving on to our next order of business, it is the vote to schedule the show cause hearings for Lucky Mart and New England Beverage and in the packet. Um, we had the reports, the police reports with, with regard to the violations. So we need to schedule um, disciplinary hearings for those two establishments, which I think Michael, we, Mr. Gilberto, we could do on, we can schedule them on the same, the same day, same evening's meeting, right? Um, so do yes, we have that, a motion, that's, correct. Mr. that's actually preferable as well because the police department will normally attend as well. Yeah, we have one for both. Can, uh, may I ask a quick question, Madam Chair? Um, should we, for New England beverage, um, should we do this uh, hearing before we talk about the application for the license transfer or should it go the other way around? So uh, that was going to come up. If it's if you'll permit me to skip again along in the agenda, the uh, there is a new attorney that's representing that licensee, and the new attorney is gathering information that the board requested. So when we get to that point, the board will have to entertain his email request to continue the public hearing for this evening. So okay. he did, on behalf of the licensee, ask for continuance because he's still trying to gather information. And in his email, he explained that he thinks, for whatever reason, the licensee was confused when he was presenting us with the information that he was presenting us. So okay. he wants to be able to, with certainty, <clears throat> that. So when that does come up, I think we would be just agreeing to continue it under certain contingencies. Um, so I think we should go ahead and move forward, um, but I'll hear from my colleagues if you disagree with that. Anybody? Might as well just move forward. Yeah. All right, so do we have a motion, Mr. Studo? Madam Chair. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Gilberto. Excuse me, we, Mr. Studo. So I'm sorry for interrupting, but we did leave the proposed time blank for each of the hearings. Um, November 16th is when we anticipate asking the board to take up um, tax classification. I think the board customarily would take up something like that at 7.30 p.m. Um, so we would just need to figure out if we want to try to schedule these hearings before or, or after classification that, that evening and how long we want to leave for them. My, my recommendation would be after that, the tax classification usually takes quite a bit of time. So um, we'd want to get finished with that and then have enough time to go through these disciplinary matters. But, so would collect, do you, does the board think we should schedule these at 8 and 8.30 or 8 and 9? Can I ask another question? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. If somebody may know this. I, I could have sworn I I went to a board meeting last year, you know, just as a citizen, but was was Route 28 Lucky Mart, were they the ones that had a violation last year too? Or was that a different one? That was, that was, yes. It was Lucky Mart. Okay. All right. And, um, and I'm So it's not a first violation that we'll be entertaining now. It's. And is that something that maybe in the for the 
Board of Selectmen meeting packets I can get like information on? Would it be there from last year or? We could provide it's, that, yes. Okay, provided. thank you. I, it looked familiar. I just, I, I you know, I'm, I'm assuming we should, you know, just take a look at that and see. Okay, thank you. So that's typically provided for a disciplinary hearing, but what we have to do is set up the meeting time and day and then notify the licensee that that's going to be, um, notify the licensee that that's going to be the hearing date, okay. date and time. Um, and then we have the, the, usually the police chief appears to explain the situation of the violation to us as well. Okay. So, um, do we, do, does everybody, does eight o'clock work, do you think, folks? Eight o'clock to what, have the, have the show cause hearings? Yes. I mean, generally, tax classification will take, what time are we going to start the meeting? I know. We're starting at 7, Mike, Michael, right? Yeah, so we'd normally have had tax classification at, at 7.30, um, but we can, you know, certainly, you know, look to have it at a different time if that's what we would like to do. Moving it up earlier in the agenda to 7.15. Yeah. If you'd like, yes. I just think that typically, even though it, it would seem to be a, a quick presentation, but typically that, that takes quite a bit of time and it generates a, quite a bit of questions um, and the t since I've been on the board. So I would think we'd want to desert, give it a little bit of time, at least a, a 30 minute, because that's typically what it takes to to hear the presentation and then hear the question and the answer after that. Okay. So 7.30? Well, I mean, to, to, to me, I, I think these um, uh, show cause hearings, you know, probably a half an hour each, you know, so if we were to start at 6.30, have the tax classification at 7.30, you know, we would, you know, I think we'd have plenty of time to keep on schedule and not and again, not have this attorney and these other business people, you know, here until 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, just because we have a tax classification, tax classification here. Um, I think we can schedule it like Mr. Gilberto recommended at 730 and then schedule these show cause hearings at 8 and 830. That, that would be my recommendation. Um, and then if we happen to get through with, uh, you know, through with one sooner than that, we can certainly visit other, other items on the agenda in between. <clears throat> do we have a motion, Mr. Studo? Yes, we do. Madam Chair, I move to schedule a show cause hearing for Smoke and Snacks, Inc., DBA, Route 28, Lucky Mart for Monday, November 16, 2020 at 8. PM. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Nina Pelli is aye. Do we have another motion? Madam Chair, I move the schedule of show cause hearing. For Sunny Rhea Inc., DBA New England Beverage from Monday, November 16th, 2020 at 8 30 p.m. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Menu Pelli is aye. Okay, so those will, those licensees will get notice and get more um, information in our packet. Uh, the next order of business is to review annual licensee, license fees for 2021. Uh, Mr. Gilberto put in our packet the um, license fees that are collected by all uh, establishments. I had asked if we could consider as a board waiving the renewal fees for section 12 licensees, which are the restaurants, just as a way to try to 
assist those licensees because they've, you know, suffered financially from the closing. Uh, I don't know if that's something that my colleagues would like to entertain, but if, if you want to make any comment on that, happy to hear your comment on that. Mr. O'Leary, any thoughts? Uh, just uh, what's the dollar and cents um, associated with it? it? It looked like everything was kind of lumped together, Mr. Gilberto. So are you able to tell the board for Section 12 <laughs> restaurant licenses what the, what the specific um, renewal fees would be? His clubs sure. were lumped in there, I think, with... Um, you, you're talking about the common bitch is all alcohol? So, it wasn't broken down, but I'm talking about for the restaurants. So it wasn't really broken down like that in our packet. Sure. So in terms of the individual fee for the common victual or all alcohol, it, the, the fee is $4,600. In terms of the, the grand total, um, impact that we could be talking about in terms of the revenues. I have that by category for um, alcohol licenses and for other licenses. And so for alcohol licenses, the total is $65,050. I, I do not have it broken down further, uh, further than that at this point in time. And then it's $8,350 for any of the other licenses that you see on that listing. So um, if, if we want to take some comment about this, but perhaps we can have that further broken down if this is something that the board wants to consider. Um, and, a, and but we, I think we need the information broken down in terms of how many of these, what's specifically attended to our section 12 licensees. Um, but I don't know if I'll hear Mr. O'Leary any further comment. No, I'm just looking at it, it's a, the the chart that was prov provided to us. So that's so forty six hundred dollars. The quarter is fifteen. We have ten. So that's forty six thousand. I assume for for, for those uh, all alcohol license, and then we just have one wine and malt, which is twenty eight hundred dollars. And then uh, I don't know what the notes mean. But then you got then you got the package stores and the. Um, and again, as far as the impact, if you're talking seven over seventy thousand dollars or sixty five thousand to seventy three seventy four thousand um, dollars I'd like to hear a little bit from um, town administrator and, and finance director as to um, that coupled with decreased revenues uh, again, I'm for helping out the local businesses, but I don't know that we can afford to to do it a hundred percent either you know some reduced percentage amount but Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the impact going to be if we're going to forego sixty-five to seventy, seventy-three thousand dollars in revenue in a year that we're going to be short additionally? I, I know the finance director is is uh, is on the meeting this evening, so if uh, Liz, you're willing to uh, weigh in, that would be appreciated. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Liz. Hi. Liz. Hi. So um, the town administrator um, and I talked about our different local receipts uh, last week. We addressed uh, some of them at our uh, financial planning team meeting on Friday. And um, what I said to you know the committee and to the town administrator is that we have some areas that will be adjusted through the tax recap um, process as they are annually. Um, and I believe that, you know, we would be able to absorb at least 50% of the um, loss in license revenue um, this year. I can't guarantee that for FY22. Um, and the reason for that is uh, local aid has come in higher than what we had budgeted. 
um, and new growth, we you know won't know what that is until we get closer to the <clears throat> classification hearing. So there is some wiggle room in local receipts um, and adjustments that can be made, but we also need to make an adjustment to investment income um, just according to how the interest rates are going with the economy. The majority of our investment income is driven by the um, sale of town-owned land that's invested on a CD. So, um, you know, I, I think that we can do 50% if we, you know, really, if the board's preference was to do 100%, then we could, we would just have to, you know, monitor it. Um, but I don't know that we'd be able to offer it again in FY22. So we may not want to go all in for FY21. Um, but we, we would be able to absorb some of it. This and uh, this is just speaking in terms of the Section 12 restaurant licenses, right? Yes, that's all I was speaking to. The two amounts. Well, I, I'm speaking to the 65,000 and the 8,000 that the town administrator just um, mentioned as the amounts. Um, you know, if we dig further and break them down uh, for you, we can you know figure that out. But even with the 65 and the 8,000, I'm saying. It, at least 50 percent we could absorb i have a uh, madam chair miss uh, O'Leary, will you did oh, you have sorry. any other questions for, <clears throat> for not, yet, not yet not yet i'm good for right now thank you mrs Tuda. um question a question for you know for mr gilberto and then a question for liz when are the license renewals typically due they are the licenses that we're talking about by statute are due by November 30th. So okay, we have sent so out renewal packets and those applications um, in order to preserve their interest in the license being renewed, they need to get it back to us by the end of November. Okay. Well, and the, and the reason I ask is because, um, you know, to me, you can tell the biggest shortfall real estate taxes, right? Big revenue. So I was wondering if there's a way to see what the receipts are going to look like for the upcoming, you know, for the November, I think they were due today and just see, you know, how much of a shortfall we have, you know, versus what we did last quarter, and then maybe decide that way, meaning that if we're lower than even we thought, maybe it, it can just, it would give me some guidance just to see, you know, as a town, are we, are we treading water enough to afford it, or did we fall off a cliff even more so than, I always forget, I think it was what, fiscal Fiscal year Q3, uh, uh, yeah, for whatever was due back in May 1st, it then was extended. So I don't know if that's possible, but then it seems that if we wait till November 30th, then, you know, it kind of doesn't align with the time of when they're due anyways. So I don't know. It would make me more comfortable to, you know, maybe take that up. And I want to help in whatever way, but if I know the tax receipts on the real estate side didn't fall off a cliff, it would be easier to swallow. Okay, thanks, Mr. Strudel. Mr. Gilberto has his hand raised. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Rourke uh, did provide us an update on receipts through September 30th, I believe, at our financial planning team on Friday. Um, so uh, that may, it, it won't be 100% accurate, but it'll give you an indicator, Mr. Sudo, of where things stand financially. So, uh, Liz, would you be able to give just a, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but just a quick snapshot? Uh, sure. Would you like me to share my screen or um, through the or chair, if that's okay? Or would you rather me just uh, verbally go through it? It's not going to address um, Mr. Sudo's question in regards to taxes that you know are still being processed as of today, meaning property taxes, um, and then comparing them. So I think it's better that we. Um, address that maybe even before the quickly before the classification hearing or we can um you know do that at a later date but i i think that addressing the the tax payments that have been received in fy 21 um through november 2nd would be a, a good driver to compare to last year 
uh, there aren't, as I mentioned on Friday in our financial planning team meeting, um, it's broken out with local receipts, which consists of motor vehicle excise and license and permits, investment income, meals tax. Um, you know, and those categories um, are down slightly from FY20. And it's just due to um, uncollectibles for motor vehicle at this point. Meals tax, we had reduced uh, the estimated budget amount for the reason that we knew that, you know, restaurants were either closed or, you know, not doing business or not doing takeout for quite some time. So that was down about 25,000. We also had reduced um, investment income budgeted amount, um, but that, is still, um, you know, exceeding, but the reason it is exceeding is due to the sale of town owned land. Um, our other bank accounts are, you know, very minimal interest earning. Um, and, uh, you know, taxes, it's hard to say right now. So I think that we should look at uh, two quarters and see how, how they match up to FY20 for real estate um, and personal property taxes. Okay. Ms. Tistrudel, any other questions? No, just uh, a comment that when COVID's over, if you guys wave that $25 one day, you know, wine thing, I'll throw a party for everybody over 21 at Ipswich River Park <laughs> and provide the wine. Um, all right, Mr. Walner, any comment, question? Or? Yeah, I'm, I must, I'm just trying to follow the, the line items. We're not talking, are we talking package stores? Um, as part of this? No, no. No, we're not. Okay. So it's just restaurants and things like that. I'm, I'm probably a little less inclined to do this simply because when we talk about tax classification, you know, we've always kept the business taxes to be the same as residential. And um, I don't know. I mean, we could have, you know, it's always been an ongoing discussion. Should we charge more for businesses like other communities do? But we've never decided to do that. For good reason, but I just I'm feeling just a little less inclined to do it here. So that's just my general feeling. I'm not anti anybody business or anti friendly to businesses. It just feels like we've also have been fair to the businesses over many years. So um, you know, see seventy thousand sounds like a lot to me. So that's it. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Any question comment? So Liz is saying that um, she's recommending that if we do this, that we do it in half, not not go full. So it would be more like forty thousand, Liz. I'm not sure Liz is actually recommending it. Well, no, I'm just giving I'm just giving guidance. Yeah. Um, and those two revenue amounts, you know, um, as the town administrator mentioned, are a, a combination. So I, I think that the, uh, so, you know, um, select board's office, along with the town administrator's office and the finance office need to go through those and um, pull out exactly what uh, you guys are looking to do to get a revenue amount. But I'm just saying that I wouldn't, you know, this is the first year of leading into future years of um, hard times. So I, I just want us to be you know, cognizant of that. Okay, thank you. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just Liz, I mean, obviously, you know, meals tax is going to be adversely impacted, you know, for the fiscal year we're in right now. Uh, just because the restaurants are doing, they're doing 20, 25% of what they were doing before, maybe even less. Um, investment interest income has got to be significantly less um, th than what it was because those CDs, the bigger CDs came due, what, May? Correct, yes. Yeah. And I don't know, I forget what rate we renewed them at, but not terrific, but better than having renewed them this month instead of, uh, you know. Um, and again, right, so to give you an idea, uh, Mr. O'Leary, so last year for FY20, we budgeted $210,000 for investment income, and that was part of our, you know, uh, phasing down plan. Um, and at that, 
as September, through September 30th, 2019, we had collected 248,000. So we were already over our, you know, uh, our budgeted number. This year for FY21, we budgeted 160,000 and we've collected 104 to date. And like I said, the major driving force behind that 104,000 is the, the CD. Yeah, I understand, but, but again, you budgeted 10, but I, our actual receipts were, what, 450? At the end of the year, you're speaking? Right, it, yeah. I mean, so yeah. I mean, we, we always yeah. are very conservative in relation to, to these, these numbers, so it, as far as the actual, but the, the bottom line is, you know, banks aren't paying what they were paying before, so interest income is down, meals taxes are down, um, excise taxes, we're going to see, as people are hurting a little bit more, we're going to see delinquencies on those, and that probably hasn't totally hit yet. And then as far as the real estate taxes, to Mr. Studo's question, uh, I forget what the percentages are, but the vast majority of real estate taxes are paid through escrows, through mortgage right. lenders and brokers and uh, investors. Uh, I forget and what, we're not going to see an impact with that yet. You know, we won't see an impact on that yet because it's going to be a while before they exhaust their escrow and the, the lenders start chasing people for, for the additional money. So I, I'm saying we're probably you know two or three quarters away from that. That's when you're assessing foreclosures and things of that nature. And generally, the lending institutions will pay the taxes for a while uh, before they go and chase it and just add, add it to the, the bill for the, for the borrower later on. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I, I'm in favor of doing something for, for these uh, most impacted uh, establishments because it's, it has been significant. And it, it is really, you know, about 10, 10, uh, 10 institutions here, you know, or 10 businesses. Uh, again, I, I don't think the package uh, package stores and all alcohol licenses or beer and wine licenses have, have suffered too much. If anything, the business probably increased. More people are around and up and, and home and, you know, finding a way to recreate and, uh, you know, having little COVID parties or something, you know, just to- Before 9.30. Before 9.30, yeah, I know. You know, but, but for the rest of them, you know, and, and again, same thing with some, maybe some of these other licenses in relation to, um, you know, the automatic amusement. I mean, it's only $100. Um, but those are generally in the same establishments that, you know, have been impacted. So, I mean, if we're going to do something for, for the restaurants, you know, who are the most significantly impacted, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with doing something there. Well, so maybe well, the, well, Liz is here to give us a, you know, a closeout picture anyway. So maybe we could um, that dock at this. I know the applications are due um, by November 30th, but, you know, maybe what we can do is at our next meeting after we've got more information to determine whether or not we're going to take a vote on it and, and decide because we can always, we don't have to do 50%, we could always do 25% reduction or 10% reduction. Um, but I appreciate my colleagues' willingness to discuss it. And I understand we, we are usually conservative with regard to these financial issues. So I appreciate our willingness to discuss it and consider it. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to the finance director, um, Liz, you know, we, we will start to see applications trickle in in the next couple of weeks, although I think history has told us that we generally receive the bulk of them, you know, pretty close to the deadline. Um, is, is this something where we've, people have already reapplied that we could issue them a, a refund, partial refund or something like that? Are you are you saying that they've already paid for FY twenty one? So these would be count their calendar year licenses, Liz. So they renew on January first, and they generally are making payment with their application in November of the uh, calendar year before, but in the same fiscal year. So it would be twenty one. We can give a refund within FY twenty one. I can't go back to FY twenty. No, no. This would just be for twenty one. They only pay the the fees once. Fiscal year 21 payment will be made in, in November. The only other thing to do, uh, possibly, is just hold their check until the board takes action. You know, don't, don't cash it and then call them up and say, you know, they've modified it and bring in a check for half the amount rather than the full amount. But 
because I don't think you've processed anything yet. I don't believe we have. You don't have an yeah. awful lot. Of, I don't think we're going to tinker with a lot of them. We're just going to tinker with a, a handful, a couple of handfuls. Uh, so they're due by November 30th, no matter what. And yep. this isn't going to change the fact that the licensee still has to file a renewal application with the requisite fee by November 30th. And I think we have a pretty good track record with Jane following up on making sure everyone's application, renewal applications are in and letting us know which ones aren't in. So um, I think if we can get a bit more of a financial picture from Liz, and then maybe we put it on to the next, um, to the next, uh, if, if the collective determination is to do some sort of a reduction, and I can pull, I'll pull my colleagues to see if that's what they want. I, I haven't heard that from the majority yet. So then maybe perhaps we could put it on for a vote at the next meeting, which is December 6th, I think. Right, Mr. Gilberto? At November 16th would be the next board meeting. Oh, December 6th was wishful thinking. So, <laughs> so maybe we can put it on for a vote. November 16th. I don't have that one diary, so I better put that in the put it put it in the book. So Mr. O'Leary, I hear, is in favor of considering some sort of a reduction. Yes. Mrs. Mrs. Gonzalez, you are you're shaking your head yes to. Mr. Walner is not. I can. I'm hearing you're not really in favor of. I'm I'm I'm, I'm hesitant, but I could also compromise. So I'm not. I'm not hard one way or the other. I'm just bringing up that, you know, we've always kept their rates at residential levels. So it's not like we haven't done things over the years to help them out. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Strudo is not in favor? No, I, I, I'm in favor of doing something. I just wanted okay. to see what the numbers are to come up with the percentage. Okay, so for those, if we don't see that in the presentation that we're about to see, what, we, what would you specifically want to know um, from the finance director? I know you mentioned real estate. You're talking about the, not the deficiency, but the, the um, reduction in those amounts that we collect. Yeah, maybe some sort of, rather than... Uh you know, year over year, like past performance, uh, more of future expected projection, like a pro forma some t sort. I mean, I can't hold anybody to it because the numbers change every day with COVID and everything going on, but just a projection of based on the experience, based on what you see and what you're seeing, like, I mean, what should we expect the same kind of decrease in the next six months or do we think it's going to get progressively worse? And, you know, and again, I can't, we're not going to hold anybody to it because they're all projections, but something um, I like to make decisions b based on educated future guesses than last year. Like I think last year's data really doesn't tell me anything. Okay. All right. Well, thank you to the members for taking this up for consideration. Um, our Next order of business is the, it, it would be a vote. We had an APM hearing on uh, the Paradise Inc. doing business in its New England beverage. That was the, okay, Mr. Gilberto has his hand Thank raised. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. The finance director and I will certainly do our best to try to give you a projection. I just, I don't want to I don't want to create an expectation that we are not, we're not able to to meet because, you know, this is you know, in addition to the uncertainty that comes with any economic downturn, we know that this is the most uncertain of the uncertain, but we will, we will do our best to provide information that helps in the decision making at the next meeting. So I'm sorry, I moved on before I saw you raising your hand. Okay. And I apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Madam I Chair. appreciate the members considering this. I understand, Mr. Walner, your point, but I think if the projections are that the meals tax is down, that means that these particular establishments are also hurting financially. And especially with these new orders coming in where their hours are restricted even more, I, that was the reason why I asked the board to consider, you know, some sort of a reduction. Um, and I think that if there's a, 
collective uh, majority that wants to do that, let's put that on the docket for the next meeting. And then we will hear some more about what, you know, financially we're capable of doing to make a more informed decision whether we even want to do that. So, uh, but again, it's not going to interrupt or disrupt the requirement, the statutory requirement for the licensees to get their application in by the end of November and get their uh, renewal check in as well. So, um, I appreciate it. So now we're going to move on to the, we, we did have the scheduled public hearing that was continued from our last meeting to this meeting. And, you know, my colleagues will, will remember that that was because of the lack of information or the need request for more additional financial information, which has not been presented. However, um, today the town administrator received a request to continue tonight's continued public hearing. So as a board, we have to take a vote on it. So our options would be to vote to allow the continuance. And if that is going to be considered by the board, then I would ask you to put it, put a contingency upon that, that the licensee in writing, not by an email, but in a, a writing signed, um, acknowledges that the licensee has requested the continuance and that the board's granted and there'll be no constructive approval of that, um, that, that the, the pledge as well as the continuance of the transfer will be addressed by the board at the, at the continued public hearing. So there's been no vote on it. Um, and then uh, if not, the, the board can always take up the matter of at eight o'clock, take up the matter and vote to approve or deny the transfer and the pledge. But the licensee is now represented by council apparently who has asked for the matter to be continued. So what's the board's pleasure? Mr. O'Leary? Well, I'm in favor of uh, granting them the uh, extension. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez, you're muted. I'm in favor of granting the extension also. All right, um, Mr. Studo, you're shaking your head to grant them the extension? Yes, yes, sorry. Mr. Walner? Yes, and I'm fine too. All right, so I'm being, <laughs> I'm being warned by Mr. Gilberto, I guess we need to wait till eight to do that vote. So I okay. think we can, jump around again and um there has to be a full moon out there there must be a full moon out there we can jump around again and ask um mrs rock to give us her close out how about if we move on to that then we'll call this vote back at eight i'm sorry folks we're either moving along faster than i think we are or we're gonna be delayed at eight o'clock so miss miss rock are you able to to jump in here? I am. Um, uh, Madam Chair, may I share my screen to show of the course. presentation? Of course. Yes, that would be great. Can everybody see this or should I try and uh, have a different display? No, it's, it's definitely visible. Okay. All right. So um, probably the last two fiscal years, we've had a fiscal year end uh, review once we've had free cash certified and retained earnings certified for the enterprise funds. So I will quickly go through um, a snapshot of uh, free cash and retained earnings as well as the municipal side's uh, departmental expenditure turnbacks uh, detailed out by department. For uh, free cash certification as of July 1st, 2020, for FY21, free cash was certified at uh, $4,058,410. Um, water, re which is higher than um, July 1 of 2019. Uh, July 1 of 2019 was around 3.3, almost 3.4. Uh, 
um, water retained earnings uh, for July 1, 2020. Uh, you probably are looking at, at this number and being, uh, are quite shocked of how low it is, um, but there are several factors that came into play with this number being so low. So water retained earnings was certified at $14,665. Um, some of the factors that played a role in retained earnings being so low is that uh, water bills were due uh, June 30th, 2020, and many of those payments were received after June 30th, as you can imagine. Um, uncollected water bills for FY20 increased 195,000 over FY 2019. So that played a huge impact where um, expenditures exceeded revenues for uh, FY20 um, for water. And um, we also had excess usage at which then increased our purchases of water from Andover. And as I just mentioned that the expenditures exceeded revenues You'll also remember that we did a budget amendment at June town meeting. Um, I believe the number was approximately 120,000 that came from uh, retained earnings. And then we transferred the remaining retained earnings from water enterprise into the water infrastructure stabilization, which we have historically done over the past few years. Uh, so, you know, we are in a good position where we don't have de uh, a deficit within our retained earnings. However, it is much lower than we typically um, earn in retained earnings. So this is something that we will need to monitor throughout FY21. We will um, work with the water superintendent to you know, see how we can work out the billing due dates. And we can also, um, you know, definitely do a rate study, which I think is necessary because we have not had an increase um, for a few years now. So um, I think that the Department of Revenue, when we do the tax rate setting, may have us look at the rates to see that we will, you know, um, not need an increase or we will need an increase. They do look at the enterprise funds. Um, you know, annually for those those reasons. They ask, you know, what was the previous fiscal year's uh, water rate? What is your current year's water rate? Um, and then they analyze it to make sure that you will achieve those, your, your budget figures, both revenues and expenditures. Um, Before you go on with regard to that, I'd, I'd like to just ask the members if they have any specific questions with regard to the those figures for water retained earnings. Um, sure. Mr. O'Leary. Liz, is this just a timing issue, you believe, in relation to the uh, uncollected, you know, after June 30th, or is it uh, a combination of things? Because if, if we think about the, the deal that we've struck with Andover from a couple of years ago, um, we should be in a, in a far better position. We didn't, we didn't reduce water rates. Um, so our usage may be down. Um, we didn't reduce the rates, but our cost of water dropped. Correct, but usage was up. The usage was up. So is it, is if it's if it's up, our revenue should be up. Correct, but it was we again, we, we, don't, we don't operate at a deficit with 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 Andover in relation to Andover. So is it just a timing <laughs> issue in relation to collections? Yes, it is. Um, but what do we normally the, what do we normally have? What do we had historically over the last you know three or four years? In retained earnings uh, in the five hundred thousand dollar range right that's what I thought it was mm -hmm. significant mm -hmm. uh, we so had un we had uncollected water for FY20 of three hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars and FY19 um, was significantly lower as, as I mentioned what, what, what significantly lower to, to the tune of what uh, FY20 uncollected water increased $195,000 over FY19. Okay, so $195,000, but that still doesn't make up the delta between, you know, $250,000 and $500,000. Well, the, the other issue was the um, increased usage, which then um, increased our purchases of water from Andover, and that, has, that was not billed yet. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, yeah, no, I, 
I get it. I just want to yeah. know if, if the Delta is going to be made up at a, at a future date. So all of a sudden we're going to have a, uh, if, if everybody pays their water bill. Um, well, it will be leaned if they don't. So. No, I know. It, it just, but at some point we should be able to, to look at, you know, what the carryover was from mm -hmm. the previous two years and what it is now. And actually, we're actually in pretty good shape. We should be having around $400,000, you know, which is where we normally, you know, four to $500,000. Correct. Yes. And um, the town administrator and myself did, you know, we spoke with the water superintendent and I specifically, you know, um, drilled down in the figures with him. Um, and, you know, he does feel that there needs to be a increase um, in the water rate and that we need to have, you know, a water rate hearing. Um, and we will be monitoring things closely. Um, and we will also be uh, checking to see what the current uncollected is for FY20 as of um, the end of this month. So we, we are monitoring things and seeing where things land. Um, but as you all know, if you, you know, your, if you don't pay your water bill, it does get leaned and then it does get leaned on your taxes as well. So um, it does eventually get collected. Uh, it's a, this specifically for FY20 was a timing issue and it had to do with just everything that was uh, going on and getting the, the water and trash bills out. Um, trash was also in the same situation um, as well. So, you know, um, for an example, FY19, we collected um, 200,000 more in trash fee than we did for FY20. And again, that was due to the, the timing of the bills being due. So, do you feel, um, do you feel well, what is your feeling in relation to the Department of Revenue coming in? I mean, this is an extremely low number in them, you know, critiquing us and saying, you need to raise your rates. When in essence, we may not need to raise our rates. Um, do we feel confident that we can explain away, you know, yes. five hundred thousand to fourteen thousand dollars? I mean, we we can. We we um, Mark Clark, the water superintendent, and myself. Um, like I said, we spent some time, you know, drilling down on the factors that would play a role in in such reduced um, water retained earnings. There also, when we paid the um, Andover bill, that was a timing issue as well. So that then was um, an encumbrance and it was a rather large encumbrance, which then that plays, that gets deducted. Your reserve for encumbrances gets deducted from your undesignated fund balance um, because you plan on using that dollar figure at some time in the f future. And that and the last Andover water bill um, was not paid until FY21. So that's why I said there's several factors. There was, you know, the bills being due June 30th, the excess purchases from Andover and when those Andover bills were paid and that the reserve for encumbrances carried forward. Um, and also the budget adjustment that we did at um, June town meeting, I believe the expense came in a little higher than what we adjusted. So, you know, there, there's many things that I can explain to the Department of Revenue. Um, they still may suggest that we evaluate and, and you know, see if uh, a water rate increase is necessary. And again, our usage for this summer was substantial. Um, people being home, putting in new lawns, planting gardens, and we had that one period where we tapped out our uh, allotment as to what we could buy from Andover, uh, which we'd never done before. So our revenue in the current fiscal year is gonna be substantially more as are our, our expenses, but our revenue is going to be substantially more. If just, we collect, if we collect. Yeah, if, if we collect it. But so what I'm hearing is, is it was a timing on the billing that threw this off? It was a timing on the billing, yes. Um, and, you know, that there was some added expenses, um, you know, that were paid out and we didn't have the revenues basically to uh, pay for it. Well, what were those what were those expenditures, Liz? I'm going to defer to the town administrator on the what the budget amendment was for um, at 
June town meeting. Um, I, I keep forgetting it was for Water. The water temporary water chlorination facility that we were required to construct because of the, um, the PFAS issue that we had at the West Village pump station. So, you know, Madam Chair, if you and I know that we're now after saying we would be quick, we're now after eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, a couple of things that I think that we we all need to keep in mind is that the retained earnings that we were generating were, was by design um, when we escalated the rate between five and 10% for consecutive years in the 2014, 15 and 16 range. And we were doing that purposely to try to get the rate aligned to where we thought it would need to be with regard to the MWRA um, and also to set aside funding to try to um, sort of level out the impact in the later years of those rate increases. Because we didn't go with the MWRA and went with the Andover um, uh, IMA, we were able to stop those increases after I think only three years of doing them when we had planned on doing them for, for seven years. Um, so I don't think we were always intending to generate that high level of retained earnings year over year. Um, this current, this past fiscal year, you know, in addition to the high demand, our wells were turned off in November, December and remained off and have remained off since then. So there was no supplement of water being produced here in North Reading from our wells and requiring us to make up the difference um, from um, by purchasing additional water from Andover prior to when we expected to do so. And while I, I know on paper to see the reduced number is concerning, the fact that we were able to absorb that expense um, through the course of the fiscal year, I think shows to the overall health of where our water enterprise was at. Um, we bought quite a bit more water from Andover because we were not producing water from our wells a year prior than we were expecting to do that. And we still were able to, to level out even when we had this delay in, uh, in the payments. So, you know, I know when we talk about the rate, that's always a sensitive issue. Um, but, you know, I, I think that we're, we're sort of at where we expected to be, if not in a, in a better position, when we started looking at the long-term planning because we were able to, as evidenced by the fact we were able to absorb that additional expense without having to make any change, any significant change to the budget or to the rate this current fiscal year. So the board will be presented additional information on this, not only in the water rate budget, budget the water budget presentation in February, but also at the water rate hearing, which may, we may wish to have earlier than we normally have. We've been having it in June, but obviously if there's a, you know, additional adjustments that has to be made, we'll do it sooner rather than later. So just to be clear on this slide in for this particular issue, the reason why the retained earnings is so low is we have not yet collected on the billing that's been issued. Is that that's accurate? Of, that that that's is correct. Two, that's one of two impacts. Okay. Yes. And then the second impact you're saying is because we had expenditures that had to be taken out. But how much were the expenditures? So the, the expenditures that I believe Ms. Rourke was speaking to um, was $130,000 for the water chlorination uh, plant. Um, but there was also, and, and I'm, I'm going off the top of my head, but I believe there was somewhere between two hundred fifty dollars and $300,000 worth of additional water that we had to purchase from Andover that we had not yet adjusted our budget to account for. And we're still able to absorb that in the context of the budget without making that adjustment, which I think, again, is because of the good position that we were in financially. There may need to be an adjustment. Um, how much that adjustment is would depend upon how much we want to generate and return at retained earnings year over year in the future. There was a four or three or four, I should say, there was three years of a seven year plan to generate, you know, ultimately what we hope would be in the millions of dollars of retained earnings. Um, I don't think that that was our, it needs to be our long-term intent now that we've got this um, solution in, in place for, for water. All right, so we have 195,000 uncollected. We have 200,000 in excess usage purchases from water from Andover. And we have $130,000 additional chlorination station expenditure. So we're just, but for that 200,000 that is the excess usage charge to Andover, mm -hmm. we're still collecting that back from our water users. Correct. We are, yes, yes. we are. 
So it, it's timing um, where the bills are due June 30th and the fiscal year ends June 30th. Um, you know, if I was to run a report now to see what our uncollected was, I'm sure that it is down from 195,000. Um, so we basically in FY21 are collecting for FY20 bills, but we had to, you know, pay for our, some of our excess water purchase, um, you know, from the FY20's budget. So. Okay, so we'll, we'll actually be, it, our retained earnings will be higher ultimately if we do, if and when we do collect, than they would have been because of that. Yes, yes. And, this, and it, because also, of the installation of smart meters too, right? Yes, we do have some that we still read. Um, so that was a, a timing thing as well. So as long as we continue collecting and we don't end up in the same, you know, cycle at the end of FY21, that you're, you're absolutely correct that this plays a role into our certification of retained earnings as of July 1, 2021. Um, so, you know, as long as we continue along this path and we collect our FY20 uncollected and that, you know, our billing, um, dates work out and give the residents enough time, you know, to to pay their bills before the end of the fiscal year, um, we should be we should be okay. So I mean, to not this is my first year in nine years that, you know, water retained earnings has been so low. Um, Mr. O'Leary definitely can speak to, you know, prior to me uh, being the finance director in North Reading, um, they had a few years of uh, negative retained earnings that that always needed to be addressed at October town meeting before the you know recap uh, was complete. So um, you know we we definitely have, as the town administrator said, achieved um, and that was our goal was to continue achieving high retained earnings and then transferring those retained earnings to the water infrastructure stabilization so that we could build up that stabilization fund and, you know, do uh, water infrastructure projects uh, from, from that, you know, cash that's available rather than, you know, borrowing for, you know, short, shorter term items, whether it's a new water truck that's five years or, you know, something that doesn't have a long um, borrowing lifespan. So we have, you know, done very well and I, I truly believe that you know the uh, the majority of this uh, has to do with the, the timing of the bills okay mr you know but see mr o'leary and i can probably ask a hundred more questions and i do i do want to give the other members a chance but go ahead mr o'leary go uh, ahead i i just want to make a couple of points. So one, Liz is absolutely correct. You know, uh, prior to her tenure here, uh, we had a checkered past with uh, our uh, retained earnings in the water department and we were on a regular basis being dinged by the Department of Revenue in, in relation to our rates and having to adjust them um, sometimes twice in a year. Um, and again, the boards in the past have made a concerted effort to stabilize things. And then as we were talking about going to MWRA, as Mr. Gilberto pointed out, uh, we uh, stepped up the pace in order to uh, build up the retained earnings so that when we finally transitioned over, because we knew that the rates for the MWRA were going to be substantially more, we wanted to be able to have a basically a rate stabilization fund to minimize the impact moving forward so that it would stabilize in years, you know, seven through 10 or 12. And then when we finally struck the deal with Andover with the IMA, uh, the cost for us would be substantially less and we had uh, substantially. I guess what, what's most concerning to me is um, the evaporation, <laughs> no pun intended, you know, of, of the uh, retained earnings, uh, e even with a timing issue to that degree already. I just don't, um, I didn't anticipate having the need to stabilize the rates for the retained earnings in one fell swoop like this and I and again even the numbers we're talking about Liz are not going to get us back up where we were which, which is fine but um, it's still substantially the retained areas will be substantially less than what they were so anyway so I, I'll just uh, await the uh, the full uh, impact report in relation to what, what's uncollected 
what our uses was, and I know it was substantial this summer. Um, and again, if there's a problem with uh, the formula that we had, that we have here, um, we never anticipated, at least in my recollection, operating at a, at a deficit this early into the IMA. No, no, I, exactly. No. I, I, agree. And, and, I was, I was nor, like, nor having to, to operate at a deficit where we needed to use the retained earnings. If it's a timing issue, that's one. That's one thing. That's fine. We have the retained earnings to to take care of those timing issues in relation to when we get the bill, when we pay the bill, and when we collect the money. Uh, but this is a, a substantial swing. But I, I won't belabor it anymore. I just I'll wait the the information. And we can we can talk offline later. That's fine. Uh, and, and no, you know, it was also it, there. Also, would have been sufficient funds in the retained earnings to cover those kind of those okay. kind of costs. They were, which is why you're there. So that's why the number is alarming, I think, too. Yes. See, $14,000 from something that we expect would be four or 500000 That's pretty alarming to see that. Very alarming. And I have to tell you that, um, you know, I had to close some encumbrances in order for it not to be um, in the negative. So encumbrances that we no longer needed to, there was no outstanding um, invoices for. So um, I think that the water superintendent and I, um, you know, should maybe, and this can be up to the town administrator and, and yourself, Madam Chair, of, of maybe a, De a December board meeting, like the first one we give, you know, kind of a, a summary of where we are to date in FY21, um, both revenues and expenditures and uncollected and, and collected, as well as a, a more uh, detailed, um, outlined, you know, these are the revenues that we collected, these were the water liens that we collected, that type of thing, so that we can have it on paper, kind of like what we're going to do for the municipal general fund, where we break it out by department, we could actually break it out by line item for the water department, just to kind of um, red flag the areas that, you know, drove this. And again, if we're looking at, you know, purchasing almost 100% of our water from Andover, it's not 100% total, you know, as opposed to the 65, 70% before, you know, what impact is that going to have in relation to the rates that we have set and uh, the collectability of things? I mean, that, that's the key right now because we're, we're transitioning to 100% Andover sooner than anticipated uh, for a couple of unforeseen reasons. And uh, if that's going to impact what our rate needs to be, we need to know that already. And I'm sure Mark already does. So. When I joined the board, that's, I, the projection was to join the MWRA. And I think we need to do that for, to project out like that, project out rates that we're going to need to consider over the course of the next five or 10 years to make sure that we're not in a deficit and to make sure that we get the retained earnings to where they should be. So does any, do any of the other members have any questions before Liz moves on? Ms. Gonzalez, you're all set. Mr. Studo, all set. Mm -hmm. Mr. Walner? No questions. I'm glad you guys understand it. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay, Liz, so thanks, moving on. Um, Parks and Rec retained earnings uh, was down as well, um, you know, from, uh, where they were it certified as of July 1, 2019. And this, you know, mainly is um, driven from the pandemic and programs that they needed to, you know, cancel. Um, they, with canceling those programs, you know, the offset was not expending on them, but um, this was lower than what they had projected, but it is mainly driven, um, you know, from the, the closure of, um, buildings and uh, their programs being canceled. So, you know, um, they weren't too happy about this, but I, you know, they um, hope to have a better year now that they're coming up with uh, different ways to offer programs. And Hillview retained earnings, um, you know, is pretty much in the area where, you know, between 500 and 600, thousand is where they kind of fall. Um, so once again, they like Parks and Rec, if, you know, um, as um, 
George Sack always says, you know, they run it like a business and um, if they're not bringing in the revenues, they're not going to purchase something that they may have needed or, you know, they'll go, they'll go without. So even though they have an expenditure budget that is approved at town meeting, they many times will not go, you know, will not spend some of their items just because of their revenue forecast. So um, I feel that they ended the year, um, you know, well, but also the majority of their season was before the pandemic happened. So we have to keep that in mind. I, I can address, I, I met with the Hillview Commission the, uh, the other night too, and we talked about <clears throat> the retained earnings about 534. Can generally the Hillview would like to uh, carry about one and a half times its debt service, you know, so it's a little bit below. These retainings right now are a little bit below, but they also are uh, in this last budget go around, they've been a little bit more aggressive in uh, allocating funds for purchases uh, in advance for things. And as Liz said, they generally wait until the spring to make some of these purchases so that if play is down, they don't have to spend the money. So there's a $250,000 sitting there right now that they're anticipating spending on uh, needed equipment and improvements on the course that they have uh, the flexibility to postpone in order to um, reach their bogey. But again, generally they like to have in excess of 1.5 times the debt service and that right now they're probably at about 1.2. Um, so again, it's very well managed. Um, they, they know where they're at. They know what they want to do, what they need to do. And um, fortunately, you know, even through with the pandemic here, the play for this summer has actually been uh, pretty good. So um, it's, it's, it's been a good year, believe it or not. So that's so far. But again, the fiscal year runs. It's going to start up in the spring, see if we have a you know, a late spring or late start or a rainy spring, then that will impact what the dollar, dollar figures are gonna be. Um, and Liz, I just have a quick question on parks and recreation. You know, I, I know that we, we tap retain earnings to um, pay for some of their, their operating budget. Uh, do we see this as having an impact in the upcoming fiscal year where this is, less than what they normally would have. And I, again, I don't know what the, what the Parks and Rec's goal is as far as a retained earning dollar amount, but. You know, um, over the past nine years, their retained earnings started off, you know, very, very minimal when they became an enterprise fund and then they've grown, you know, they've grown them. Um, they typically don't exceed 300,000. So, you know, um, they, did have um, different COVID expenses that were just related to the enterprise fund, which did not fall under um, some of the criteria to be reimbursed um, or, and have those expenses moved to the CARES Act grant. So that was part of it. Um, you know, I spoke with Maureen Stevens um, this afternoon via email and she was asking, you know, uh, about accruing their COVID expenses over, you know, the next three years and would that have impacted their retained earnings and things like that. So they are looking, you know, and w monitoring their budget very closely for um, FY21. So, you know, uh, it's very similar to Hillview, um, but not to the same extreme. Uh, because they have more uh, personnel costs uh, versus Hillview only has, you know, a, a part-time person. Um, but, you know, they're, they're monitoring their, their revenues and their expenses. And, you know, if a program isn't going to um, bring them in the revenue that they need in order to run the program, they're, they're not running the, the nice. certain programs. So, um, you know, I think that, Water and parks and rec are definitely areas that uh, the finance team has to continue to, along with the departments, um, you know, monitor closely in FY21. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions on that slide? We're good? Okay. Uh, okay, moving on. So um, this is just a quick uh, overview of our um, free cash and how we, how we, you know, some of the areas of how we achieved 
uh, the four million in free cash. And then the next slide goes into the detail of each department on the municipal side and what they uh, turn back. So revenues exceeded expenditures by 1.6 million. Um, departmental expenditure turn backs were almost 3 million. And this is on the municipal side. Um, one of the largest uh, generators had to do with uh, pension and benefits. Um, and as we know, uh, a majority of that um, was uh, the PFA savings that we then transferred into the stabilization fund at October town meeting. And then we had smaller account deficits um, for FY20 compared to FY19. Uh, so you can see those listed below. And um, the rule uh, of thumb for definitely the, the SR ones, which stands for special revenue, is that we either have to have received the revenue by the time that we submit the balance sheet to the Department of Revenue, or we have to, if we submit the balance sheet later than September 30th, the revenue has to be received by September 30th. So there's always some lag within chapter 90 and the two 911 grants. It's just the processing time. They are all submitted prior to June 30th for reimbursement. However, um, they, they take some time to go through the expenses that we're asking to be reimbursed. Um, and the federal income tax withheld and deferred comp is just a timing issue of, of the payroll going out. Um, and the other two are, are very minor. So um, any questions on that? Quick red list. Okay. So um, I know that this is kind of hard to read. I also have an Excel spreadsheet that I can pull up if, if need be, but this is a um, slide that uh, details out the departmental expenditure turnbacks um, by department. And, um, you know, you can see uh, what has been turned back. And as I mentioned, pension and benefits was our, our largest. Um, and then after pension and benefits would be uh, debt service. There was some um, uh, payments uh, that we didn't borrow for that we had budgeted for we banned instead of long term borrowed and um, Moving on from there would be um, Public works and then um, The police departments um, and then the salary pool and um, we can see that the fire department, um, you know, turned back a significant amount compared to some years uh, prior. So, you know, due to the pandemic, a lot of departments, you know, during that time period, obviously were not purchasing, you know, their normal expenses. Um, and then the expenses that they were uh, incurring were, you know, mainly due to uh, COVID-19, which were reimbursable by the CARES Act and the smaller uh, different grants that we had received. So um, this is how we ended the year. Um, and this is what generated our 4 million um, in, in free cash. And yeah, I, I, I wish that I wish that, uh, oh, you sorry. know, sorry, no, that's okay. I, I just wanted to say, I wish that select board um, member Masiri was uh, still, still with us because uh, he would, you know, um, be able to elaborate uh, much, you know, more in detail. And I know Mr. O'Leary can vouch for that because this was one of his, um, one of his babies that he really, uh, he really liked digging into. Miss him every time we meet, I miss the guy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. it so much. He was a great mentor. Terrific. Uh, quick question, Liz. Just in relation to the, the, the turnbacks here, how much is directly related to the COVID reimbursements? In other words, that may not be, re that not be recurring. <clears throat> so on the municipal side, we, you know, just offhand, and I looked at it earlier, we transferred about 270,000 um, of expenses. 
So, and the school side um, had, a, I want to say, you know, maybe around numbers 170, 190 in that range. So, but for, um, for the town or municipal side, I should say, it was, I want to say about 267, 270, some, around there. All right, so not, not a significant amount in relation to, <clears throat> let's see, 2.9, so yeah, okay. So, and we do have, you know, um, as you all know, we were granted 1.3 million in the, the CARES Act and we had to do another drawdown um, that is still awaiting approval on Friday. And then um, we have a chance to look at everything through December 30th uh, for, you know, further expenses related to, to, to COVID. So, um, there will be some that take place in FY21 um, as well, Mr. O'Leary. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions, Mrs. Gonzalez? No, nope. all set. Mr. Strudel, all set. Mr. Mm -hmm. Waller? I'm all set. Thank you. All set. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, you were all set too, right? I'm good. Thank you. All right, so we're, like I said, we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> a few things on that. A few things on that presentation that we're gonna have to start uh, targeting and tracking and preparing for. Um, and so we'll go back to our eight o'clock public hearing. Uh, and we will take a vote on the request for continuance by, um, Paradise R2 Inc. doing business as New England Beverage. Uh, the vote to continue the public hearing on the pledge of license and transfer of license that was requested today by their council, whose name escapes me, Mr. Gilberto. Do you remember who that was? I believe it's Attorney Rudzer, and I believe he has joined oh, us here this evening, all actually. Right, great. Okay, Attorney Rudzer, let's turn to you. Yes, uh, good evening, Madam Chairman. Good evening. Members I'm sorry. Of I don't believe we, we've all been right. jumping around, and I knew you were a new face, but I didn't, I didn't know why you were here. So welcome. Uh, my name is James Rudzer, and I'm going to be representing Paradise R2, Inc. Uh, as this application process continues before the select board, and then if it advances past this stage with the ABCC. Um, I had a chance to review the prior hearing that was on YouTube and then my client's application. And as a result of what I read and what I heard, um, I believe that my client may have misspoke at a prior hearing or sort of mischaracterized a, a relationship that, that some, he, before he entered this agreement, he had another written agreement with to buy a portion or shares in a stock in a corporation that held another liquor license. I think that's the source of where he said he had a silent partnership. Um, I did not represent him in that transaction, nor did I represent the the prospective seller of those shares in as much as it's another client of mine that I had previously done license work for. Um, that's what the agreement is. I have to track it down from council who, who were the parties to that. I would like to get that agreement to the board because I think it, it, it casts uh, the proper light uh, of, of what his prior statement, and then especially in light of one of the public comments that, uh, that my client had some concealed interest that would be completely in violation of chapter 138. So if it pleases the board, could I have a little bit more time to get those documents and present it to the members? And if the board would uh, grant our request to extend it this hearing to the next public hearing date. So I think we were collectively of the mind to continuing it. And Mr. Gilberto, that would be on. Um, so would we be required to repost it? I know we have to repost it. Does it, the continuation of the public hearing have to be republished? Because if it does, I think it would need at least two weeks of republishing. 
We, with all of the disruption that we've had with our, our meetings in the past few months, we've tried to err on the side of advertising more so rather than less. So, um, for example, you know, we would, you know, even though something has been continued, the pure letter, letter of the law may not require to be advertised, but we would put it in and advertise anyway. I also think we took comment in favor and in opposition. I don't know if we closed that because I do think we did close it at the last hearing, actually. Um, that's one of the things I think are, I need, I wanted to add to the minutes, matter of fact. So I think we closed that and then we, when we started to question the applicant, I think that's what gave the board uh, cause to pause on a vote on the application. So am I remembering that incorrectly? Mr. Gilberto, I, I don't recall the the hearing. I don't I don't recall whether the hearing was closed or not. To be candid, uh, okay. I, I know I know that we asked for some additional right. information, um, which uh, obviously has not materialized as of yet, but apparently will materialize at some point in the future. So your recommendation would be now we just voted to schedule the show cause hearings for our next meeting. So your recommendation would be to continue to the first December meeting that we have? I just, I think that we're going to be dealing with a number of things on the 16th. Um, and so, you know, it's the board's decision, obviously, but it, it may be able to, to be um, given, you know, additional attention at, at that December 7th meeting, I believe it would be. But so it's up to Attorney Brudzer, that would be, I think if the board is going to grant the continuance, that would be uh, held over till that December 7th or 6th? 7th. 7th meeting. That would be the next um, meeting and that would afford some publication ability as well as we'd be addressing the show cause. I don't know if you're representing the licensee on the show cause, but we have that one coming up at our next meeting. That's the, uh, on the 16th. That's correct. Okay. Um, yeah. I uh, I haven't been retained yet for the show cause, but if the next available date for hearing on the transfer and the pledge is December seventh, and if it, it you won't, it, it's agreeable with us if if it's agreeable. And is that enough time? Is I'm asking you to make sure yes. that's enough time yes. for you to be able to get the documentation that you were looking yes. to put together. I'm rather confident us. of being able to get okay. it. That's great. And so by holding it over until then also um we'd also want for you to acknowledge on the record that there is not going to be any constructive approval of the license because the board hasn't taken an official action on it although we have officially acted to open the public hearing and we have to take official action to vote to continue it but that you know that there would need to be some sort of acknowledgement that you understand that that we're still con considering it, so yes. our time <laughs> is extended based on the request for the continuance. If it would be a condition of the board's vote to approve my request, I certainly would, uh, on behalf of my client, uh, waive the period of time uh, between now and then, um, go on the record and affirmatively state there will be no claim of constructive grant as a result of the, 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 the granting of my instant request. So, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So what is the board's pleasure? Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to continue the transfer of license, pledge of license, uh, hearing of Paradise R2 Inc. DBA New England Beverage to Monday, de December 6th? 7th. 7th. Sorry, 7th. Mr. Okay. Gilberto, should we put it to a time certain as well? Do you want to say 7.30? Okay. May At 7.30. 7.30. I'll second. Motion by Mr. Studo. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further <coughs> discussion? Okay. Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Menu Pelli is aye. All right. Thanks, Attorney Rudza, for hanging Thank in you, there. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairman, members of the board. I'll see you we'll in see you uh, December. Soon. Thank you.
All right, so now we're on to the town administrator's report. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just briefly, for uh, those who have not um, seen it advertised or otherwise heard, the Department of Public Works will host a household hazardous waste day on Saturday, November 14th from 9 o'clock a.m. to 12 o'clock noon. And I attached additional information that's also up on the website. Curbside collection of yard waste, including grass clippings, leaves, and small branches will take place on Saturday, November 21st and Saturday, December 5th. Waste must be curbside by 6.30 a.m. Please note, no plastic bags or barrels. Branches must be no greater than three inches diameter. Cut the lengths of no, no more than three feet. The branches must be bundled and tied, but not bagged. The compost center at the DPW garage remains open on Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. through the end of November. And it will be open on Sundays in the month of November, as is the custom between 12 noon and 4 p.m. Um, I've been speaking with the uh, information technology director and we do have an opportunity to try a new virtual meeting software uh, go to meeting um, it's something that is available for um, um, collective uh, group purchasing uh, through the state uh, we did a quick trial of it and uh, i think we're pleased with what we saw so um, look to try out that different platform different than zoom for that December meeting that we've discussed. I don't think we should put it for the tax classification hearing just because that's such a significant meeting and we generally have so much participation. So if you have any issues, we certainly don't want to um, disrupt that, but we would like to try that for the Monday, December 7th meeting. Um, and then um, finally, I, I know I didn't have a written comment in there but uh, I know folks are kind of wondering what's going on with our uh, search for director of public works. Uh, we did go through and advertise um, and received some applications over the summer. We went through an, an interview process and interviewed two candidates and ultimately uh, neither of the candidates um, were uh, selected to be appointed. So we have re-advertised the position through the MMA and on the town website. Um, and uh, we are uh, looking to see what we receive for applications between now and November 10th when the next uh, closing deadline occurs. Um, the department has been in, um, in my opinion, very capable hands in the uh, acting director, Mr. Deming, over the past uh, five months and with the support of the different department heads within that department as well as the administrative staff. And there will uh, be more to come relative to um, a permanent director, hopefully um, later this calendar year. And, Thanks, Mr. Gilberto, for go to meetings. Is there a learning curve for us? Are we going to get a little training on that in advance? Uh, I, I, I'm fearful there's a learning curve for me um, first, because if I can't operate it, then it won't be any use for anyone else to utilize. Uh, we did do a trial um, on uh, Wednesday, I believe, of last week. And um, it was not just myself, but folks who also um, facilitate other board meetings. And uh, we found it to be pretty intuitive and to operate pretty similar to Zoom. Um, I think we've had a lot of success with Zoom, honestly, and I, I kind of uh, am reluctant to move away from it, but there's a significant cost savings and it also provides a built-in uh, transcription service with GoToMeeting, which I thought would be beneficial for a number of our boards um, here in town, which is why we wanted to at least give it a shot without sort of jumping right into it. Um, and so you know, we think for the December 7th meeting, that might be a good chance to try that. Maybe you could, in advance, do what the courts and the administrative agencies do and just send each of the five of us a link, you know, in 10 minute incremental time frame. So we can each, you know, take, take a half an hour, we can each join you and you can walk yes. us through it. And That's that'll give idea. you a little bit more practice too. Yes. <laughs> Maybe no, be in advance of that. That's a great uh, idea, we'll do that. Thank so. you. That's what they, the courts and the administrative agencies have done to, to kind of teach us on Zoom and WebEx. So we should try that too, it, for those of us that need it. So, um, okay, Thank any you, questions Mr. for Mr. Gilberto? Mrs. Gonzalez? No. Anything? Mr. Studo? Mr. O'Leary? No. Thank you. Mr. Walner? No. No, awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. All right, I think we're on to old and new business. So, Mrs. Gonzalez, anything? 
Um, nope, just uh, if you haven't voted yet, get out there tomorrow, do it in person. It's gonna be safe. I have all the faith in the world in our, in our clerk and um, doing it safely. So get out and do it. Um, and you know, just, I don't know that this even matters, but it just seems more and more I see these used masks on the ground everywhere. And um, just, I don't know, be a little more careful about disposing them. It's just, I just, I, I just can't believe how much I'm noticing them in the stop and shop parking lot and just wherever I go. Um, if everybody could just take a little more care and, and put them in the trash. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Studo, anything? Pull the note? Nope. I'll set Mr. O'Leary. A uh, couple things. One is I thought we were going to discuss the um, appointment procedures uh, that we utilize. I know uh, Mr. Walner spent some time on it, and conferred with me as we agreed to do uh, a few months ago. And then at the last meeting, we agreed to <clears throat> uh, take a look at it and propose uh, some suggested changes. And I thought I anticipated it being on the agenda tonight, but it's not. So I'd like to have it on uh, the next meeting because obviously the appointment process is taking place and all the rest. And I think the public and anybody who's uh, looking to volunteer should have a clear understanding as to what the procedures are, how they're gonna be handled, how the board's gonna handle it. Um, I think what we did at the last meeting was explain to people that if they wanted to be considered that to fill out the citizens activity form. I think, as you can see from this meeting, which was a light agenda, we had, we still are at a pretty lengthy meeting and the next couple of meetings coming up are also lengthy. I also think we need to schedule in a strategic planning because rather than piecemeal looking at the policies, which I think we might collectively agree all need probably updating because they're they're, they're pretty old, um, that that would be one out of many that we could actually consider on strategic planning. My report was gonna be to ask the members to look at their calendars for a strategic planning meeting, but I think the process, I think the policy is pretty obviously has, hasn't really been strictly followed anyway for a long, long time, at least since I've been around on the board. So. I think what we talked about was making sure people that were interested would be filling out the citizen activity form. The liaisons were going to be getting in touch with prospective appointees. Mr. Gilberto talked about the publishing of all the positions and we reviewed the list of positions. So it certainly would be a policy that we could review at an upcoming <laughs> meeting, but it's really not going to have any impact on what is and has been done and then ultimately as we ended our meeting it was ultimately the board by majority vote puts the appointees in so but it's i think not going to disrupt or interfere with the process no, that think, we've embarked upon year after year after year to fill the vacancies i know that you have at least two members of this board who were extremely interested in visiting and discussing this and making sure that there was more clarity as to uh, what our responsibilities were as liaisons to ensure that uh, the chairperson of the board committee of commissions recommendations were brought forth to the entire board and the community as a whole which didn't occur last year um, we were looking to get things clarified and i think it's unfortunate that the that the chair has decided not to put this on an agenda again this isn't the first time and, and i think uh, unilaterally dismissing with at least two members and again mr studer wasn't involved he's a He's the newbie, um, you know, he should be afforded the opportunity to, to hear the discussion, go through with it and determine what the, whether the policy is adequate or, or inadequate. And again, for those people who are volunteering, they need to be assured that they're gonna be treated fairly. Uh, to the chairmen of the boards, committees and commissions, they need to know that their positions are gonna be clearly articulated and accurately articulated. Mm -hmm. And they weren't. And here we are ignoring it again. And I think it's unfortunate. I th and I think I to, one to, to universally determined not to do that and not to discuss it is wrong. 
Yeah, I don't think anyone's determined that. So that would be your interpretation. That's not, you're not listening if you think that. No, I'm well, listening. I'm listening and well, I know that you requested, to, you requested to put it on the agenda. It probably won't be on the tax classification meeting and it probably won't be on the show cause meeting where we have a lot to address on each and every one of these agendas. So again, tonight, with which was a rather lean agenda in comparison to the agenda that we've been handling, we're still at almost 9 p.m. and we're not concluded with the meeting. So I think it's not something that anyone is suggesting be ignored. I, I would I believe it was ignored. And I totally disagree with you on that. As the chair that you're saying is ignoring it, I totally disagree. Were you requested to have it put on the agenda? Excuse me? Were you requested to have it put on the agenda? I'm not going to get into a debate with you the about answer, that. Yes, and you denied the, the opportunity of a member of the board or two members of the board. No, that's discuss. not accurate. And the, the member of the board that requested it was told that it would be put on an agenda in the future, an upcoming agenda in the future. So but not on a timely basis when we're doing the reappointments. There's nothing, there's nothing about the review of that policy that's going to disrupt appointments. And there's nothing about that that is going to prevent chair the liaison from presenting the chair of any board or commission's opinion on appointments. And there's nothing about that policy review that's going to prevent a liaison from making a recommendation on appointments. And there's nothing about that policy that's going to change the fact that a majority of the board has to vote for an appointee. Yeah, it's just a, it's transparency and how the, how the board moves forward. Again, this is a policy that hasn't been followed by the board for years. So if you want to talk about transparency, yep, I'd be happy to talk about it. If you such put, an outdated yeah. policy that it's it absurd to, to throw around a word like transparency. Right. Is there anything else, Mr. O'Leary, that you have for your old and new business? Uh, yeah, I would request that it be put on the agenda, first and foremost. And then secondly, I'd also, again, urge everybody to go out and vote tomorrow and uh, exercise their right. And weather's going to be good, so go out and do it. Can I just make a quick comment? I know I had, um, Mr. Laird, to your point, because I was trying to do it. Uh, Mr. Gilberto was able to forward me the, I guess, policy and I know, I know we didn't talk about it a lot, but it was pretty just like, uh, unless I'm missing it, it was pretty self-explanatory to me. So I don't, I don't know if I'm missing again, I wasn't here last year, but just reading it from what we have in written rule, it doesn't seem, you know, again, like I, um, I'm always up for a refresher, but just, I, I just wanted to make sure like, don't, I don't want everybody to like go crazy on my account. Just no, it's not a that. question of going crazy, but you weren't afforded the opportunity to review the drafts. Uh, amendments that were being proposed because they weren't forwarded to you. They're not supposed to be agenda. forwarded. In the interest of transparency and the open meeting law, we're supposed to be addressing these in meetings and the member who you've circled back with, who told you that it wasn't going to be addressed, Mr. Walner he clearly. He told me it wasn't going to be that's, addressed. That's, that's not addressed. accurate because Mr. Gilberto got back to him and told him it would be put on an agenda in the future. I don't, I don't know. I just didn't see it on the agenda. Apparently you do, in the interest of I, transparency. You want to debate this, so apparently no, you I just do. want to make sure, and by the way, during the normal course of business, if there are proposed amendments to anything, that would be part of the packet and forwarded. But it wasn't even part of the packet. So, so anyway, Mr. Studo, you didn't have the opportunity to even review what was being proposed, unfortunately. And it's not going to change the fact that the no, policy no. is a policy. It's not a rule of law. And in the end, like we talked about at our last meeting, the ultimate determination of who the appointee is is by a vote of the majority of the board. No dispute. That's always the way it's been. And no there dispute. hasn't been an issue with transparency in that since I've been on the board. So are all set, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, as set as I could possibly be, thank you. All set, Mr. Studo? Mm -hmm. Mr. Walner? Yeah, just being the guy who did go through the policies, I, you know, obviously looked at the procedure as well, and I didn't alter anything but the very last section of the procedure. 
And the only reason why I, why I did that was because I actually felt like all the other material was close enough to what we were trying to achieve. And the big miss from last year was the chair and the liaison were not on the same page and the information that was presented to us was not accurate. Basically, there was lying going on. So the, the, biggest, the biggest thing is that yes, we have the ultimate authority to decide uh, what should happen for those committees, but we have to have accurate information. And it was clearly an inaccurate information that we received last year, which caused, if we remember, meetings that followed and in the paper, we were criticized quite heavily for not shoring up that one hole. And that's really all my attempt to do is just make that, that part be when the recommendation comes from the liaison to this group, that if there is any controversy between the chair and the liaison, that it is presented to us and it's clear. And then we can decide from there. But if we don't have that information, you can't make good decisions. And that's a, that's a failure of a process. And that was my only attempt to correct that. So um, that's what's out there. And it's very simple language. I don't think it's, I think we're spending more time talking about it than we could have reviewed it tonight, but that's okay. I look forward to it happening soon. Um, the other thing is uh, just for Mike Roberto, um, uh, Phil Hertz from the bike, um, you know, the bike grant, he's looking for us to review that uh, contract, that $45,000 contract. And there's a time thing on that. So I'll just write you separately and, you know, we'll find a time. If you want to come down, we can just go through with them so we can get that going because it's about three, four months out at this point. Okay, so, I'll like, follow up on that, on that, Mr. Walner. Thank you. Yeah, but if you want, uh, do you want me to arrange a time for us to get together? Would that be good? Yeah, that would be helpful, actually. Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll schedule a time and we can just get that done and keep that moving along. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay, and from the chair, I'm not going to let you get away with saying there was lying going on last year just like last year you and mr o'leary were not going to get away with saying that we violated the open meeting law by three members of the board who voted together or voted jointly had prearranged our votes i'm not going to let you get away with that the policy is a policy it's just that it's guidance and in the end, the, we did not do anything inconsistent with the policy. And you were at the meeting and you know very well that Mr. Gilberto represented what the chairman wanted of the particular board that we're talking about. So I'm not going to let you get away with slinging allegations that it it's, doesn't meet decorum, it's inappropriate, and it's, it's just not, it's not right. It's, it's incorrect facts too. Um, that is so I would like to us to focus in on strategic planning, which, as we know, we need to reschedule that. And I think the whole set of policies should be revamped because the whole set of policies is outdated. So that could be one of our efforts in terms of strategic planning, not just the piecemeal policy that's being thrown up here to, to cause discuss, further discussion about something that happened a year ago it's not going to change how we continue the appointment process which is open and transparent and it's it, done it was not open and transparent last year in that one case you know that and it's very clear so actually you again know, we're, we're, we're not gonna we're, we're not gonna get into the debate that was carried out for that week and the week in the paper and following which etc that that was inappropriate to treat the three members of the board like that, who were not in cahoots in violating the open meeting law in advance. I, I, didn't, I don't know what you're talking about with that. All I know is- I that think you do. And I think no, we're I done with the discussion. We can yeah, move on. The be, members were not know, looking at their calendars. I think we I need to always, work on rescheduling. We were not presented with that information. And I just want to prevent that. And I don't want to have anybody- Chair in the was texting. To the to the to the board. What's that? We we knew where the chair stood. I, I don't know what that means. All I know is we weren't presented with acting information. So we do need to reschedule. If Mr. Strudo is available, we do need to reschedule strategic planning. And if this is such a crucial issue then we should re be looking at all the policies which are outdated. So that could be one of many things that we consider at our strategic planning meeting if the collective majority of the board wants to, to do that. 
Um, so what do we have for time? Mr. Gilberto, anything specifically that you can give us for dates? Because you usually attend with us and take minutes. Yes. And I tried, tried more importantly to update the uh, the plan along the way. Um, so it, you know, right. right. You're off. You're muted. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I think we've often, I think we've often tried to schedule it in the off week um, where we don't have a board meeting, um, just to try to be respectful of everybody's time. But we don't have to do that. We can do it 24 hours. I don't sleep. <laughs> we do it 2 a.m. It doesn't matter what time you schedule it. So. <laughs> looking to get out of baby duty that's what he's looking no at. no i will be holding the baby <laughs> while we do it so yeah everyone's coming we madam chair we do have uh three weeks between our november 16th meeting and the next meeting on december uh 7th i believe uh, although i would ask if any of the board members have their calendars in front of them and can kind of corroborate that because last time i was called to work on the schedule. I think I, I made a mistake and we ended up scheduling a hearing for a night that we didn't have a meeting schedules. Well, I but think I, we, because of the Thanksgiving week, we skipped over that one. So yeah. I'm, I'm fairly certain and that's why we, I think that's why we plan these for the second and the 16th and then the seventh because the 23rd is the week of vacation. Right. But so, in other words, you want to do a Monday evening, uh, or or just picking one of those, you know, one of those weeks could also be an opportunity. I mean, we could potentially consider Wednesday, December second. It's a Wednesday after. I, and I say a Wednesday because the board, I think, has generally done that meeting on a Wednesday. So does every do all the members have the second available um, for an evening an evening meeting? Um, I'm actually going to be out of town during that, that particular day. That's actually why we might not have had a meeting. Is it, are you gone that whole week? Yeah. I mean, I could, uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I could potentially get on a Zoom meeting, though, but it's probably going to take us two, three hours, I would assume. Oh, yeah. This one takes Yeah. Time. I'd probably best if I didn't do that. So I can do the next week, the ninth. So do, does everybody have the ninth? Yeah. Um, what time would we be? That's a Wednesday, right? Wednesday the ninth. I'm in Lexington on Wednesdays and or the Thursday the, the, 10th? Commute. the evening of the tenth. Does do people members have the tenth, Mr. Gilberto? Do you have I work Thursday night? Okay. That's not right. anyways. <laughs> So the um, the week of the fourteenth. Did we did we talk about the first? Yeah. Could we do it in? Uh, oh no, because I'm also gone. Okay. I think you're going to be looking after the first of the year. To be honest with you. <laughs> the way you know, with the holidays coming up, people tied up on Wednesday and Thursday evenings. <clears throat> um, our meeting schedules. Can we do it on the 24th or 25th of November? That's a Tuesday. We're going to say December. <laughs> Forget Wednesday. Forget the 25th. That's dumb. Maybe the 24th, the Tuesday. I could do that. I could do it. I don't. I don't go out anymore. <laughs> <laughs> got to be in by 9:30 anyway. No, before that, it, it, Baker's got nothing on why I can't. I'm just. I'm. I'm in. So none of these policies affect me at the state level. Does um, 7 p.m. Works all right. 7 p.m. work for the members. That works. All right. Okay, so let's, let's see if, let's schedule the first 7 p.m. on the 24th. All right. And we're not going to get together, right? It's going to be Zoom again? Uh, unless we're, um, unless we're, uh, we're not going to use the new platform by that point, right? Uh, we probably would not be, although that, that could be an evening we could test it on if we wanted to. 
Um, but my thinking was December 7th, we would test it. Okay. All right. So we're. Yeah. Is, could we be in a room where we're socially distanced and far apart from each other? Could we? Oh, that? you mean meet, meeting in person? In yeah, words. yeah. Like um, the Yeah, because we do have a meeting on the 16th. Right. We are meeting on the 16th. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm just asking for the strategic meeting. Could we do that in person? I mean, I'm just asking. I, I wouldn't mind. I'll wear a mask. I mean, if we, but it doesn't matter to me. Like I, I, I mean, if the room's big enough, I don't think it really matters. But again, I don't care. We we can look into the feasibility of doing that. I mean, I'm we have fine not. With had, it if it's if we're distanced. We haven't uh, have not had any um, in person public meetings uh, since March. I think other than a couple of school committee meetings, but um, we can look and see if we can find the appropriate space to uh, to accommodate everybody. We have a little bit of time because to do it's that. A it's a posted public meeting. Correct. So. All right. If, if it can be done, if, it's no big deal if we can. I just if we could, it'd be nice to do it that way. So I think what what would have to happen is we would have to be able to have a link to it or live stream it or, um, you know, be able to have members of the public not attend in person, but at least be able to part you know attend virtually so you got to figure that out oh mr gilberto yes yeah, sure we have some work to do and if you're in a room with a tv not to like again just to not that i'm like a tech thing but we did it at my office if you have a camera and if there's a tv you can Chromecast it to the TV and literally the only difference would be that everyone shows up like this who's the public, but we're in the room and the the back and forth is pretty much the same. It's actually not it's a couple hundred dollars worth of equipment at Best Buy. No, I don't think that's the issue so much as if we're socially distancing in the room, you have to be able to Oh, I see. Yeah, you would need someone who Right. Yeah. It, you need to get all six of us at least into the picture to okay. be able to be visible and seen and heard. You need that equipment to be for everybody who's there to be seen and heard. Now, I mean, the only person that's it, I usually attended besides us is the is our reporter from the transcript. It was Bob and and Maureen, I think, but there's so. But we would have to, if we're meeting, we post this meeting as a regular public meeting of the board because we're all there and obviously the content. So it would have to be something where it was capturing us all, all sitting six, six feet apart. I, I don't think I'd really, I, I think I'd rather do the remote with it. I, I prefer the, you know, together, but I think remote works. Yeah, that's fine. It's it's too complicated. Complicated. So. Sounds too complicated. Let's leave it. It's complicated okay. enough just to pick the meeting date. <laughs> yeah, I feel. We got Besides one that, meeting. so yeah. One so me, so I, I think probably we just stick for this one. I, I'd like to do. I, I prefer to meet in person too. It's kind of an uh, one of our nice. Yeah. You know. Yeah, a little dinner together. We break break bread together before we strategically yeah. plan. But exactly. All right. Okay. So any. Anything else? Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Um, do I have a second? Second. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Studo, second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Okay. We'll Thank you. Up. Everybody have a nice night. Anybody gets bored, you can text me at any time. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody.